6 15 a.m a truck pulls out of the post office on 103rd and 8 philip randolph now they got to make one stop before they go to tallahassee and that's a mail drop at first federal third savings on moncrief and losco now kirby i want you to position yourself in the getaway car on the corner there you can see everything jose me and you we're going to be behind the bank beneath on the left and right side of the loading dock. Now, Delilah's not here, y'all, but she know where she gonna be. She gonna be in the dumpster directly across from the loading dock. Now, Skippy, I want you to position yourself approximately 10 feet from the alleyway. There, you post the lookout. Now, we all won't know what to do at the point of attack. We don't gone over this shit enough. And if anybody get caught, you shut the fuck up, and we'll keep your money. Fuck that shit, man. I'm telling you right now, if we get caught, I'm shooting my fucking way out. Put that shit down. I think we need another man on the street with Skip. Someone to cover the other side. Oh man, we don't need no other motherfucking man. Shit, I can see. Besides, we got two motherfuckers anyway. Man, fuck that shit, Kirby. We all trust everybody here, right? Right? I'm sure God gonna forgive me for this one. With all this money, you can buy your way into heaven, Reverend. See, that's where you're wrong, brother. We done already bought our way into hell. Fact is, I told God I wouldn't sin like this. To tell you the truth, I'm not even sure I want any of this dirty money. When I tell you what, we'll find something to do with your shit. Amen to that shit. No, 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 I'll take the money. I'm sure the Lord will find another way for me to do my penance. Just tell me something, Cleon. Why the fuck you didn't grab the cop? You killed him. A young brother. If he wouldn't have froze up like a bitch, then maybe I wouldn't have had to kill him. Would y'all shut the fuck up? Wow. Man, the radio said they got Joe's stupid ass. Messed it up. The whole plan was messed up. We need to do shit right out there. Shit. And y'all make sure Jose Shed go to Marcel and the kids. Duh. You know, your junkie ass really messed up out there. Nigga, don't blame me for your fuck up. I told Anthony, I didn't want to work with no crazy, devil filled junkie. What? You listen to me? Look at him. Shit. Now say some old shit, old fake ass preacher, no members having an ass motherfucker. Don't y'all stop acting like some damn clowns. <laughs> y'all niggas show is it. Now we sit here with $300,000 of unmarked cold hard cash. Now I'm gonna tell you motherfuckers something. Motherfuckers make me lose count again. We're gonna spend this shit for you. I'm gonna kill me a motherfucker. Man, I can't believe this shit. They were gonna burn all this shit, and the nigga can't even find a job. Well, that's Uncle Sam for you, baby. Money to burn. And that's the fucking trip. Ain't gonna be no money for a motherfucker. What, what the fuck, fuck is, is up, internet? Blackface much? What?
Welcome to the very last episode of season three of Trust. That is the motherfucking trailer. It has been one hell of a ride. To say the least. Have you subscribed? I have. I don't know about you, but if not, go ahead and hit that button right about now. And to our good folks at Patreon, we want to say thank you. All of our subscribers that looked out for us and just each month, you just hit that little automatic debit to TTFT to give us a little bit of what you've earned to see what we've learned. Thank and you. You can become a subscriber by... One dead president per month. A Washington. Patreon.com slash TTFT show. Or or if you or Lincoln, if you wanna be Or a Beth Grant. See what I did there? Goodbye, 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 goodbye. Oh man, we got some crazy plans in store for the future. TTFT is going to see a uh, a, a makeover. A bit, oh yeah. I mean, you know, they've already seen it a little bit now. This is just, this is just like the this is just the beginning the canvas. of the makeover. This is our French Connection version of this right now. It's a it's a what is it? It's in the wall, man. What are you doing? What movie is that? Fr French Dispatch. Oh, okay. oh yeah, yeah. It's yeah. in the wall. Yeah, it's a it's a fresca. <laughs> it's a fresca. Um. Yeah, this is going to be the stick around for coming attractions at the end of this episode because we'll dive into a little bit about what we have planned for season four. Again, what, however you recognize us now, take that out of your mind because we're about to change things up. I was going to ask you about that. I mean, there's no there's no rhyme, reason or content. We just came on and they don't know what's going on right now. Yeah, before we get into we do our research, what are we researching today? We're not researching. We're living it, Dottie. We are going down memory lane, guys. We're going down that sweet old Harlem ride. Dead presidents. You guys have no idea how long I've been waiting to review this movie here. You have no idea. And I had never seen it before this episode. My Shame mom apparently loved it, <laughs> which now we can discuss before we get into the next <laughs> segment. When we picked this film at the end of season two, it was my mom's choice. She was very excited about it. And this went on, this excitement drawn on for probably a few months before we were having a phone conversation. And she was like, um, yeah, that movie with Keanu Reeves and, uh, and uh, uh, Patrick Swayze. Like, they dress up like dead presidents. Now the world makes sense again because I, I, I now especially after watching the movie, it's not my mom's cup of tea. It's it's the the, the war. The uh, she's not into like um, full metal jackets or. Ocean. Why don't you tell the audience what film your mom was referencing? Point Break, which is a great film in, it, in its own not, right. Not Dead Presidents. And it was at that point I broke off communication with his mom because all of us look alike. I'm just playing. Wait, you were communicating with my mom? Well, through the show. Oh, Jesus Christ! Hello. All right. Um, you have any? I mean, this is your, this is your pick. No, what this you, is you, to be honest with you. This is one of those films that got swept under the rug as as we grew up and when watching film as we would call a hood classic. But that's only because, uh, and I'll get into this later, that it hasn't been mainstreamed enough for a lot of people to see it. But with that being said, this is not a hood classic. This is a classic. No, I, and I, I mean, honestly, I didn't know what kind of movie it was based on the. Like, I thought it was a heist film based on I'm, the cover. And that's right, because again, it's, it's tell the audience you literally not only had you not seen it we've not discussed it you didn't know what you were going into because just looking at the fucking cover it will make you feel like you're watching heist or heat or something like that oceans 11 with mm -hmm. an edge to it or something i did not expect to go into how Vietnam. far into the film were you into it before you knew that you were not into just a heist film um immediately Run time. <laughs> uh, I, I, at about an hour and 30 minutes into it i'm like where do they the rock heist film? is there where's the makeup at what are we getting dressed up? Am I watching the right movie? Because <laughs> this is the one I'm reviewing tomorrow. Whether this is it or not, I'm talking about the movie I just watched tomorrow. That, that was one of the things that was cool about it, though, because it was a nice slow burn. Like, mm. you you come for that, what you see on the cover mm -hmm. and what you see in the trailer, and you probably don't get that. You probably get, until, like, maybe screen time, maybe three minutes of that. It's probably 30 seconds at the beginning and two and a half at the end. But it plays, man, and we'll oh, get yeah. into it. But yeah. like I say, this is a film that, again, stacks up there. We'll get into it, and we'll discuss it. But, guys, if you haven't seen the movie, definitely check it out. And we appreciate everybody. It's, if you guys don't know, this is the last full film we will be reviewing. After this, like I say, stay around. Uh, we're going to have some great things for you guys coming in season four. Money, 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 money. Money. Dead Presidents is partly based on the real life experiences of Haywood T. Kirkland, a.k.a. R.E.S. Meretta, Meretazon? Meretazon? Am I getting that right or am I butchering it? 
my soul in it, as they say. Gotta close the shop. Um, For the win. Moretta's on, AKA R-E-S-M. His true story was detailed in Wallace Terry's book, Bloods and Oral History of the Vietnam War by Black Veterans. A Vietnam vet adjusts to life after the war while trying to support his family, but the chance of a better life may involve crime and bloodshed in the Hughes Brothers' 1995 crime drama, Dead Presidents. Widely released to some communities in the U.S. on October 6, 1995. Keep in mind, films released around this time were... <laughs> it was more than one thing going on in Harlem up in Brooklyn. Vampire in Brooklyn. Wolf to the 45th power. I want no fucking dog. Rest in peace, John Witherspoon. Leaving Las Vegas. After everything I just did for Vampire in Brooklyn, that's the best you can do for Leaving Las Vegas. There we go. All right. All right. Copycat. Elizabeth Shoes. Tadaz. Mm -hmm. Powder. I put funny story in parentheses next to this because there is a funny story about powder. I used to work at Hollywood Video. The uh, the manager of Hollywood Video, Jason House, rest in peace. He uh, had a very he had a very strong vendetta against pedophiles, and um, as most people do, yeah, rightfully so. Um, as uh, I remember, one evening when we were doing inventory, uh, and and back in the day at movie stores, inventory was like. I just know it's there. Okay. It's the same fly between me and you on the stare down and uh, when we did Tarantino's flick. It's come back. <laughs> do, 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 do. Um, they, like, you you, you get fucked up as a manager if inventory is incorrect. You like, got one all, job to do, get the inventory yeah, right. Get the movies back. Like, so to take movies as a manager, to take movies out of the store and peg them onto the pavement outside and with VHS, these aren't DVDs. These are back when VHS were a thing. Pe pegging the VHS, he took um, Michael Jackson's uh, Black and White tour and Powder out and uh, broke all the copies we had of them because, uh, of course, the allegations against Michael Jackson. Alleged. Um, but then the, uh, the 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 proven allegations against the director of Powder who uh, who has some shady things in his head and still gets hired by Buena Vista, a.k.a. Disney, still to this day. Um, hmm. But nobody was renting those movies at Hollywood Video off of Normandy Boulevard in the uh, in the late 90s because we destroyed them all. Sorry, that was a... Uh... Continue, please, sir. I think we needed that. There we go. All right. All right, with that being said, uh, a streetcar named Desiree, or in my life, Desire. Is it Desire or Desiree? It's Desire. A streetcar named Desiree. All right, here we three star, three, two, one. I think that starred uh, J uh, J Jeremy Busey. Or Bussy? Yeah, Busy. Busy. <laughs> three, two, one. A streetcar named Desire. Howling Part 7, New Moon Rising. I guess Fast and Furious weren't the first to do it. Never talk to strangers. Now and then. Mall rats. We got to cover that movie. I thought you were talking about the one you were about to say. Oh, Get Shorty, too. Get Shorty, for sure. Oh, okay, because there was no Get Shorty, too. The Babysitter. Strange Days. The Scarlet Letter. Jade. Ah, uh, Linda Fiorentino. Assassins. All right. Uh, the fucking crazy amount of movies that came out in one month. I mean, that time. was a hell of a fucking... That, you know how we've done all the movies that came out around that time? That may be the best list out of three seasons, to be honest with you. Yeah, It's all sure. over the place. Brothers Albert and Alan Hughes directed Dead Presidents based on a story they developed with Michael Henry Brown, who wrote the screenplay. Now, the Hughes brothers also wrote and directed Menace to Society, which I'll get into later, King of Cock. Uh, two years prior, in 1993, with the same cinematographer as Dead Presidents, Lisa Rensler. Shout out to, I mean, in case we forget later, special shout out to the cinematographer. Yeah, especially Beautiful. making, I'm assuming they shot the Vietnam shots in I, LA. I was, in case I forget to say it later, they made the most out of the list. You really yeah, yeah. get like three or four main set shots for Vietnam, but that sound, that score makes you feel like you were in the shit. So shout out mm -hmm. to the cinematographer and the person who did the score on that and the Foley. Yeah, yeah, the Foley for sure really added to the chaos when they were in the trenches and yeah, everything going on. Yeah. Um, together, the Hughes brothers also directed From Hell and The Book of Eli, as well as Korn's music videos for Here to Stay and Thoughtless in 2002. Out the Dead Presidents in 1995, Michael Henry's Brown script for, my dog gonna love this, You Ain't No Cop, Jay Reed, In Too Deep, which was written 
of four dead presidents, went into production to be released in 1999. Rest in peace. He passed away in 2016. Dead President stars Lorenz Tate as Anthony Curtis. Keith David as Kirby. Chris Tucker as Skip Skippy. Freddie Rodriguez as Jose. Rose Jackson as Juanita Benson. Nabouche Wright as Delala Benson. I, I knew that's that. you gave that to me on purpose. I know you did, fucker. If, if one of us is going to fuck it up. Uh, well, I, no, I, did, I didn't but fuck it up. I, okay. I'm from Wakanda. <laughs> James Pickens Jr. as Mr. Curtis. Yeah, I love him. On uh, he, was, he was the best character on Grey's Anatomy. He also had the less words out of everybody in this fucking film, too. What do you say? Through yeah. want some more call it, son? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> Jennifer Lewis as Mrs. Curtis. I don't know why I kept seeing Jennifer Lawrence when I was looking this up. Not her in the film, but seeing Jennifer I'll, Lewis. I'll get into Mrs. Curtis. I oh, know you won't. You you better don't you talk shit about Miss Curtis. Clifton Powell as motherfucking Cuddy. Motherfucking Cuddy, man. <laughs> don't laugh. We'll get there. Terrence Howard as Cowboy. Me. Bokeem Woodbine as Cleon. Bokeem Woodbine as Cleon, and we'll get there. All right, Martin Sheen. Now that, God loves you. Yeah. <laughs> All is well. Martin Sheen makes an uncredited appearance as the judge. Now, most people don't know this. Danny Elfman, which name should ring a bell, composed the music, and we shouldn't even really have to list the films he's put his stamp on in this industry. Dead Presidents was edited by Dan Leventhal. And boy, oh boy, check out some of the other films that he has cut. Dead Presidents was actually the first major film that he worked on. He did some very good things on very bad things. Very bad things in other movies we should cover. Have you okay. seen that shit? I have not. It's the original dark comedy. Okay. Uh, Eminem's Real Slim Shady music video. He reunited with the Hughes brothers for the film From Hell. Elf? Really? Santa Claus is coming! Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Uh, the Breakup. Iron Man. How the fuck did you not let me get that? Iron Man. And also Couples Retreat, which was stolen by Vince Vaughn. And Iron Man 2. <laughs> I'm not going back and forth with you anymore. Cowboys, not Terrence Howard. Cowboys and Aliens. And Thor, The Dark World. <laughs> Suck My Ant-Man. And Spider-Man, Homecoming. Suck My Ant-Man and The Wasp. Spider-Man, Far From Home. Bad Boys for Life. In 2021's Mortal Kombat. Please take that part out. That was not a fucking film. That was a disgrace to the film industry. Tootsie! <laughs> well, you know, what I, you know what I needed to do with that film? Get over here so I can throw it in the trash. Finish it. Now, fatality in the films. Now, production began on Halloween in 1994 and wrapped in February of 1995. Dead Presidents was shot in New York, Los Angeles, and- Now, I'll give it a little bit more. Production began on Halloween in 1994 and wrapped in February of 1995. It so was shot in New York, Los Angeles, and Florida, which that has that to sounds be about right. where they shot Vietnam. Florida, man. Yeah, this is a war zone anyway. <laughs> Always. The, 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 the palms, this is where you find the palms. Mm -hmm. And that's where the palms get greased. This was shot on a budget of 10 million. It made nearly 8 million just during its opening weekend with a current worldwide gross of over $24 million. Now, if you don't know this, the runtime is at an hour and 59 minutes, but it plays like something you never want to end. And the other thing I can let you guys know, the production was done by Caravan Pictures, Hollywood Productions, and Underworld Entertainment. Money, 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 money. Money. All right, guys, you know what time it is. It's time for the Kings of Connections. If you've never seen the show, which is highly unlikely, this is where we connect the real world, the fake world films, things that you didn't know that only we would know because we are masters of connecting. We know what we're doing. We see things you don't see. You're the cock, I'm the pock. Ow, pow. I shot a kid. What are you doing? Um, just getting ready. I got, I got, I got like 10 connections. I'm just, I uh, was, fuck, let me ask. I told you at the end of fucking, the beginning of season fucking two, don't smoke cigs, kids, and you're out here lighting them up like it's no tomorrow. Well, this is the Dead Presidents episode. Go for it. Everybody's smoking in that motherfucker. Yeah, you yeah. go for it. Lucky strike. Go I ahead. mean, he, uh, uh, Anthony wasn't in the beginning, but by two, two years in Vietnam, he came back. Hey, give me some squares, man. <laughs> so uh, I I'll, I'll guess I'll, I'll start my, the first connection I have is the uh, 53rd Precinct. Mm-hmm. Uh, all the police officers and dead, dead presidents are from the 53rd Precinct, a fictional precinct that was also used in the television, television series Car 54, Where Are You, and 1975's Beretta. Awesome. Now, Dead Presidents and Goodfellas. 
The connection is one of these films is considered a classic worldwide and one of them isn't. Cause, but they both are really classics. And this is what I mean by it. Look at, you may be just thinking, oh, Tarion, oh, Mr. Royal. You're just saying that because you're black and they made a black film. This is not a black film. This is a great fucking film. And I'll tell you some of the things that kind of, you know, are connected or similar between Dead Prisons and Goodfellas. Should I start with both stories center around a young man named Anthony? Oh, I've oh you've never seen the fuck. I'm sorry. So this won't be as exciting to you. But for my people, when you go back and see it, you'll love it. But both, I do agree with you. This should be considered yeah, yes. a classic. Both, both films have a crew. Yeah. Both films have a heist. Yeah. But only one film is talked about as a classic. And this is what I would like to call, um, and both films have a character named Spider. Guys, if you notice again, from the cinematography to the, the writing, to the acting, to the, it, I'm telling you, I, I challenge anybody as much as he knows that I love good fellas. I love good film regardless. It doesn't matter who makes the fucking film. It could be the Simpsons. It could be aliens. I don't care. Animals can make a fucking film. The School of Rock is another film about a group and that has a character named Spider. Yeah, kind of different feel though. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, School of Rock. Yeah, no, no. But but I, I am saying this is that both films are classic and they have very similar, maybe not setups, but the fact is that one of these films got buried is just, I mean, like I, I gotta be honest with it. I can see people who don't know anything. This is what the most beautiful thing about both these films is this. If you're not black, then then this film brings you into that world and shows you not just the bad, it shows you the good, the bad, the ugly, everything that we dealt with. And just like Goodfellas, I'm not a Italian, I'm not a mobster, but it brought me into their fucking world and it showed me things I did not know and the good, the bad, and the ugly. And so, it actually wasn't, didn't harp on like the black experience too much. No. That was kind of, that was like a side Plot. It wasn't even a side because it was just their world. It, it was, was our a, world. Yeah, it was, it was our world. It wasn't anything like, out of obscure to us. The most that I picked up on like the, the black culture experience is like uh, the sister, uh, the, the actual sister, the, the sibling <laughs> of his girlfriend. I can't remember Tester her name. Might. She's, you know, like the whole Black Panther angle and yeah. like don't what that's the white man's word. That's like the most. But like uh, graduating high school being like economic struggles possibly like going to the war because it's your only option well wow. i mean that shit and having sex for the first time and the way they portrayed that i'll give them too much right now that, yeah I mean, white or black you, you know can... it was just straight down the middle just how it affected them and just a loose connection it's not really a connection you got to watch those younger sisters man kind of got to come into a miracle field there she fucking yeah, yeah she <laughs> go ahead brother your like, turn. if i got if i got back from the war and my girlfriend's and my and my baby's mama's sister kissed me on the lips welcome like, back right. Welcome home. What the fuck do you know about your sister that I don't? That you're feeling this comfortable enough to do this to me? What has she been doing while I've been gone? Sucking dick. Oh, fucking, what's his name? Cuddy? <laughs> we'll get there. Go ahead, brother. This is... <laughs> He's gone. I don't fucking we'll even get... know his name. <laughs> we'll get there. <laughs> uh... Okay, uh, taxi driver. So did you notice when he gets back from Vietnam, the rear view mirror shot of the of the dude that's driving the taxi resembled uh, Robert De Niro. And that was actually an homage to Robert De Niro's character in Taxi Driver. I did not know that, but I would say this is that there were a lot of homages given in this film. That's very good. Give me a, that was very good. Give me another one. I did not notice that. Uh, Sopranos, Michael Imperioli, of course, he plays D'Ambrosio. D'Ambrosio, am I getting that right? Um, Tony Sirico, Officer Spinelli, and Bokeem Woodbine as Cleon would all go on to share the screen again in an episode of Sopranos called A Hit is a Hit, which uh, Michael Imperioli was in most of the Sopranos episodes. Well, and it was a uh, I'll get to that in, in, yes. in Scene Stealers. And speaking of Michael Woodbine, apparently he must have did a lot of time. You know how they say you have multiple life sentences, which is weird to me because once you give somebody life, they don't care about the other life sentences. But uh, apparently he never got out because when the sh HBO show Oz came on, he was back still in jail. I, I, I think the thing that I remember Woodbine from the most is Jason's probably uh, no, the big hit. Oh, yeah, yeah. He, he, was, good, he yeah. was great in that. Yeah, he was really He's good. good in everything. Yeah, He's got yeah. an intensity about he him does. that works. He does. Keith David served in a fictionalized account of the Vietnam War nine years before Dead Presidents in 1986's Platoon. And Martin Sheen, who has an uncredited role as a judge at the end of the movie, mm -hmm. also went to Nam 16 years prior in 1979's Apocalypse Now. Nobody, well, nobody better talk about uh, Lorenz Tate's mom. 
You you ever seen the film Minister Society? I'm going to talk about her. <laughs> Motherfucker says, and this is the, I'm not gonna do the voice, but he was like, the dude says in the store, the Korean guy says, I feel sorry for your mother. He's like, what you say about my mama? And then when he comes home from the war and dead president, uh, Skip played by Chris Tucker says, hey man, I've been taking care of your mama since I've been gone. Hey man, hey, don't be playing, man. You know how, so it made me think. Oh, like, shortly before that, we got to come into America, remember? He's like, hey man, tell your sister I said hi. Man, fuck you. Yeah, yeah, all right, man, what up? So bottom line is, don't talk about Lorenz Tate's mom, not as old dog in Men's Society, or not as Anthony in Dead Presidents. Okay, well, I'm gonna talk about her just for one second because- You bet not. Look, let me tell you something. She is the most famous TV mom and film mom of all time. She's the best acting mom of all time. I'm telling sure, you that right but now. but that doesn't make her character in Dead Presidents not a bitch when her son comes back from the war. And you gotta say kids. something. No, well, look don't. me in the eye. Look at the dad. That, he was happy as fuck. You don't just don't 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 say anything. He the man. He said he needed some space. So what are you gonna do? Or you? Uh, what are you on that? They're coming back from. Well, a lot of guys got hooked on them drugs. She was talking about Skip. Um, I'm cool, baby. Uh, I'm a split. Like, yeah, yeah, she really was. Yeah, yeah, she really he was. He has been going to see her mom. Yeah. She, she he hasn't been. See, she's been going to check up on, on him. him. Yeah, man. But, like, get the, let him fucking eat one warm meal before. I think he had four warm meals. How he was eating like major pain and fucking. Well. Yeah, so I, I, she just kind of rubbed me the wrong way in that moment. And, and it's like she's a fucking saint. Don't you say anything bad about her? That's fucking Will. Dorothy that, Mantooth is a saint. You you keep his mom's name hey, out your fucking mouth. That is that is uh, that is Will Smith's aunt from Fresh Prince of Bel Air. Okay. Oh, so it runs in the family. What? Okay. All right. And um, here we go. Um, the next thing was uh, I connected here. I connected Skip who played played by Chris Tucker. He at the beginning of the film, he explains that Pimpin runs in his family and he's not lying because years later as he's as he's in money talks as Franklin, he says while he's in jail, "Man, I had five of my finest holes, man." And you that was you know, Pimpin, I'm pimping down the car. That so Pimpin does run in the family with Chris Tucker, Skip and Franklin. Franklin! Hey man, where you show that? Uh, do you know what my connection to collateral is? I'm trying here. Let me give me a second. Don't do it. Don't do it. Don't do it. Collateral. Collateral. I was going to say a black man driving a white man around in the car, but that's not correct. It's, cl it. it's close. When when Kirby takes that's old boys in the back, and he has the power maniac. Well, no, oh, the, uh, that's another funny part. But when <laughs> when he takes Anthony on the run. Oh yeah. That moment when Anthony is sitting there and he doesn't realize what they're on a run about, and 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 he's out. And then he finds out, and there's yeah. some violent shit happening. He's got some some debts to collect. Mm -hmm. It was very reminiscent of uh, uh, he could have easily been Jamie Fox in that moment. Oh no! Shit! Very true. Very true. I, I can see that happening. I can see that. I, actually, those were all my connections. So take me home, brother. Uh, can't hardly wait. Um, you ever see Can't Hardly Wait? No. Somebody called me a fag. <laughs> uh, man. Movies have changed. This was, this oh yeah, was no, like no. a woke comedy for the '90s, and they, there dropping, was the cancel culture back then head. was to cancel canceling. Yeah, there was no yeah freedom of speech was at an all time high, kids. <laughs> Dude comes out, somebody in there called me a fag. Um, can't really wait. This isn't the first time that Freddie Rodriguez hung with a group of three dudes, and it isn't the first time that Freddie was one of the two dudes to leave the third guy hanging to go chase some tang. Uh, the grab party scene where Anthony and Jose leave Skip for the girls. It's um, that. He does pretty much the same thing to, I think his name is Pierre Facinelli, the guy that says, somebody called me a fag. He has two friends. One of them is Freddie Rodriguez. And uh, Freddie Rodriguez and his other friend, they get like, th their girlfriends are ready to to uh, bang, so. You give my uh, pussy away while I'm going? Okay. <laughs> what? What? Uh, What'd you that, say? I was like, clearly he's gonna get smacked in the face by her right now. She's nope. Like, oh, ooh, baby, I'm like. Nope. Uh, have I been talking to women wrong? My yeah, you have. Life? It makes them hot. You go home to Angie and be like, did you give somebody else my pussy today? <laughs> did Try you? It. Try it. Uh, but that that was but that, that scene was funny because speaking of uh, uh, Chris Tucker being a pimp, he's the only one in that situation. Well, I, I was going to say he was the only one in that situation that wasn't going to get laid. And it's funny, he's calling himself a pimp. His two friends are making out, going out with the girls. But he ended up with, you know, the two girls around his shoulder shortly after that. But it was funny that he ended that that moment by saying, uh, don't make me hurt my hand again. Oh, yeah, he did say that. Yeah, he did, he did say that. Yeah. And they definitely put into that stereotype of black guys in uh, Viet Cong at that time that loved me a long time. He was like, yeah, it's very big, very big. Like they, again, guys, 
uh, Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Oh, oh, fuck yeah. You know, right, yeah, yeah. Oh, fuck yeah. When he was it. Awesome, awesome scene. You know, that, that, I have that there. If, again, if since you're gonna bring it up, I'm, I'm gonna fucking bury the lead here. That's one of my favorite scenes of the fucking film. It is a seamless. They they ramp up that. What if you if people don't notice this? First off, you visually see him leaving, jumping over the thing. At first, you're thinking, oh, it's called back to Ferris Bueller, which it technically is. But just like that, before you know it, the, the score and the foley changes to you hear the war, but you don't see it yet. And next thing you know, that motherfucker's in the war. And keeping that shot on him as he's scaling the fences was mm -hmm. in, it was an incredible shot because it and wasn't no jump cut or anything it like wasn't that. a wide shot either like it was a very close quarters right. lens like that didn't give you enough room for error for somebody moving and it, so just, it was and seamless it, and let's be honest he was going from one war to another one because if oh, yeah. her mom would have caught him uh, it was going to be the same shit uh, yeah i was uh, i found myself relieved when it was oh, okay you're in vietnam you didn't get caught yeah <laughs> yeah because yeah. it would have been much worse she came up right on that right light and the camera angle is perfect to see the mom come to the trash and then both just sit there i felt that way there's no you feel like you were there running away getting out it made you get that good feel i like it man yeah money, 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 money. Money. time for the top 10 facts and i don't have any facts because there is very little information to be found about that presidents that didn't fit into the previous category or categories coming up so with this being the last episode of season three the last full-length episode that we're doing in general wanted to take a moment to give you some statistical facts about ttft and what we have what, what we've fucking done in the past uh, 565 days refer to paper now show. refer to paper now so we have completed 76 hours worth of full length episodes. We've completed eight hours of bonus episodes, 15 hours worth of standalone episodes, 4.5 hours of fucking up, 64 hours of interviews, talking to 67 different amazing interviewees, totaling 168 hours of original content, Plus all of the segments, all of the trailers, promos, and everything else that we released added on top of that for over 800 videos that have been released in the past 565 days. You could literally start watching us today, not stop for a single second, and you would not be finished until seven days from the time you started. Just so there, we're out there. So, uh, so what the atheist is saying on the seventh day, you can rest after. Yeah, go back and check out all of the shit that we've been doing. Um, it's not shit, it's at least caviar. Yeah, yeah. And with that being said, let's fucking talk about dead presidents. Money, 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 money. Money. All right, guys, time for talking to in the movies. And first thing we want to get into is theories. Uh, and I don't think this is a theory more so than actually a fact. Uh, the Hughes brothers, uh, I think they went out of their way to number one, of course, pay homage to a couple of, like you mentioned, Taxi Driver. And there are a couple other things, Ferris Bueller. So clearly they're fans of film. It's almost like if me and you made a film or another film, we like to drop little things that we love somehow and pay homage to things. But mm -hmm. what I want to say is that, again, it's not a theory. It's a fact that they truly uh, set out to make the best movie they could, but to also show the plight of what's going on without overdoing it. They really, they, they didn't throw it in your face. They just said, like you mentioned it earlier, you didn't feel like at any point they were leaning on the whole black thing or the whole war or whole this. It's like, no, if I dropped you in a time period at this time and you were of this descent, this is what you were going through. We're simply just going to show our lives. Yeah. We're not going to throw it all up in your face. There were no Black Lives Matter signs <laughs> back then. There, Even though all that stuff was still going on, there's no protest. And they actually had the courage to actually tackle stuff that people didn't if you notice um skips not skips character but his mindset was that of muhammad ali muhammad ali didn't want to go fight as he called the Viet Cong. He, they kept saying it that's not my war i ain't fighting no white man's war shit them Viet Cong, chunks whatever the fuck ain't done shit to me they even have anthony later on in the film find that that uh that verbiage that lineage and then you hear the uh his his captain or his superior say hey man get that junk out of my face or whatever so you get rid of that cocksucking common bullshit right now they live they did such a good job of saying okay if i'm if i'm a filmmaker and that's my talent how do i use my talent to express how i feel about what's going on mm -hmm. it's like a painter painting something and somebody looking into the interpreter so they made this art for people to see like i don't know if they're going to get it or when they're going to see it but we're going to be as true to ourselves and as true to the time and the era of what's going on so that's not a theory it's a fact they set out to, and i don't think that they wavered at any time based off those things so that's my that's my I agree with that. Yeah, it goes back to what we were saying before. Like, it, 
it's not really a movie about black culture mm -hmm. it's just set on the backdrop of black culture Perfect. but there's all these other things that were happening during that time that were just as relevant and i think they did a really good job at meshing them all together without harping on one i don't want to say too much because it's not really a way to do it too much but so much that it would make average moviegoers uncomfortable right. or like turned off in a certain way like they're feeling like they're being preached at about something that they might already know right if you if you notice that it's not it's not overly cursy it's not mm -hmm. overly sexual it's not overly anything it's just like it's just a day in the life or, 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 or uh, it's pretty cursy there i think it's, well. uh, it's uh, in like the top 15 of uh how many fucks are dropped in a single film uh, again it's like a, a, I, think I think bernie mac like said it best a fuck per minute i think bernie mac said it best you get around us, we use it as an adjective, a noun. A noun, it means a person, place, or thing to us. So while yeah. you heard the word, it wasn't meant as a curse word. Whether you're uh, in, like, urban warfare or Vietnam warfare, like, what the fuck do you want people to say when they're when they're in the midst of, when they're in the shit? In the shit. I'll drop these boys into the shit. Money, 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 money. Money. I want to go ahead and kind of discuss that the opening starts with again we're not going into scenes or anything but i just want to discuss the opening if you notice the one thing i truly love and this one i knew you didn't have to tell me the hughes brothers the blues brother it didn't matter who made the film i knew attention to detail was starting from the very opening of the film if you notice the opening starts with the burning of money which is ironically illegal in the united states so they're letting you know right now that whoever is doing this or whoever in this film is going to be a rebel yeah. They're they're a rebel for, against the machine, and I love that. And actually, the film is again foreshadowing the rebellionness of thing, the rebellion of things to come. Also, it was also twofold. If you notice, they also went in and they as they're going through these dollar bills that they're, they're destroying, which is illegal they're also if you kind of catch it remember there's always been all these theories about what's on the dollar bill this that and the other there you know they're, where it revealed the other one's face under underneath it well no, no not only that no when they were showing the the, the all-seeing eye and the little corner with the little spiders in the web and the mm -hmm. and the air holding the arrow 13 they would they were going on it so it's almost like hey i know what's going on but i'm not going to tell you what's not, i know what's going on you got to actually catch it yeah. and um I love the fact that they also, they taught about, see all you people out there nine days, and as I said, you people, you know the lottery. But one thing you would not know if you're not from our culture, there was a certain thing before the lottery called running numbers. They were running numbers. That was your lottery, if you will, but it wasn't being taxed. It was only being taxed by one person, should I say, or whoever was running the numbers. So that was beautiful. They got that aspect right. And then the, the beautiful part that I love about this film, a lot of films have done this before, but I don't really see it in, um, I would say in our urban culture, urban culture, when urban culture is talked about in films. Every film I had, a war film I had seen, at least that was predominantly had white people coming home. They always came home to a parade. They always came home to the VA, the checks, money and everything. This film so accurately showed you without telling you, hey, we didn't get shit when we got back. You, I, you were probably wondering, wait a minute, he just got back. Why does he have all this money? Why does he have to struggle and look for a job? Well, because even though they told us we can go fight now, they also didn't have anything set up for us when we came home from fighting. So therefore, they they, they touched on that so beautifully. It's like, and if you did come home with money, you wound up like Skip. Hey man, like some shit got into me over there. Yeah. Yeah. He said, "How you pull fifty percent medical?" So again, to me, it is the tone of this film that really you can tell they really vetted things out and there was no corners cut. And they really, uh, to me, and like I said, again, if I just want to discuss the film. To, that's the type of film I want to watch where they really like you just said make it the backdrop mm -hmm. don't put it in my face don't wave it in my face let me feel like wait a minute I want to ask those questions honey wait, wait a minute you were in the honey army honey why why didn't he get what you got when he came home you know honey I, he probably don't even know why yeah. but it exists so that's that's it my is. you know discussion on that it arguably makes it more powerful to just make it like a mm -hmm. uh, passing thought because then you're like, what did he just say? And then it makes you want to look into it more. Mm -hmm. And I'm not a historian or anything, but I think that was the general consensus for everybody coming back from Vietnam because the 60s and the like, the hippie movement happened and no anti-war, like World War II, we were like the heroes and people that came back from the war, they were like highly regarded, but I think a shift happened in America while Vietnam was happening. By the time the soldiers got back, America. You heard what the Martin Sheen says. Turned I, on them. I, 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 he, oh, don't tell me. So I was in the real war. I'm like, well, okay, shit. <laughs> yeah, like even veterans aren't respecting. Mm, right. Like, Damn. What what happened over there? I don't know enough about that to talk on it, but I don't mm. think that was like. 
I'm sure it was harder for black people because life in general was harder for black people, especially around that time. But I, I think the general consensus was soldiers, no matter what color they were, were not um, really taken care of in any way when they got back. They weren't they, they weren't taken care of, but but at least they were still considered soldiers. You have mm -hmm. to understand from uh, or you have to at least uh, acknowledge what happened is because we come back home, you have to realize, like, again, there wasn't too many people from the white community that said, hey, no, don't go fight for your country. It's yeah, people from our community that's like, you, you heard getting, Cowboy said, I think y'all was some damn fools going over there fighting that white man's war. Yeah. Now you got that from home, then you get there, you got a Chinese people saying, this ain't your war. Like, well, God damn it, who am I, what the, what the fuck am I doing? Yeah, they're getting it from both angles. Right. So it's like you you want to come back home and you want to be proud to be African American. You want to be proud to fight for your country. But then you notice it like it 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 almost not a face off feel. I'm just saying it because we recently brought it up in face off when uh Castro Troy uh when he when he didn't mean to kill the kid at the beginning, he just meant to kill John Travolta's character. Mm -hmm. You see when how it's affecting Lorenz Tate's character when he's in Vietnam. You see him looking around at the little kids rolling around with the little hats on and this that it's it's really fucking but, with him like yeah. God damn like I'm I'm killing these people. Like they're, they're people just like we are. Mm -hmm. They don't say it. It's just the background. Just they a, leave it open to interpretation. And it's really just a single shot when they're sitting in the bar, and they and, they, and he and he he's over. yeah he's stuck on the kid. Yeah. Um. The uh, going back to the the opening credits. Danny Elfman's score is so great in the whole thing, but the I love the theme over the opening credits. I think it like it perfectly lets you know what kind of movie you're about to get into because it has like the adventure heist element to it like the the, the fast pace but then it has this like there's like i don't know what sound he was using but it was like this this like reoccurring sound that would keep coming up that had this like darkness to it that made you no, no, it, I think it perfectly summed up what it you're made, about it, to get it almost into. It, it, I felt like I had heard it before or something similar but again it it starts there and then, but like I say, it, it, it let's put it this way. I think you put it perfectly. There's no need for me to elaborate on it. He really did such a good job of drawing you in. And then you're you're almost ready for the heist to happen as soon as the movie starts. You yeah. think it's going to happen. Yeah. Like you see them down there before you know it, store. How, it basically says, this is where we're at. How do we get here? Yeah. Pump the brakes, bitch. Uh, Ant Anthony Curtis, Lorenz Tate, he reminded me of Ace and paid in full. Hmm, that's good. Like bit. the the way it because this was uh, even to me more so than this being a film about the war or about the '60s or about a heist. It was a character journey. It was about yeah. it was about him, and I, it was like a tragedy mm -hmm. because it follows you. Like at the beginning, the, he you could even tell like he was kind of I was kind of iffy on his acting at the beginning, playing like the goody two shoes. Oh no way! I won't do that. <laughs> the naive the innocent mm -hmm. like i felt like that was a little bit of stretch for him mm -hmm. but i but to watch his tran is it, like a very seamless transition that kind of happens before your eyes him go from that cookie cutter character that we see in the first 15 20 minute before he goes to the, the war he see, that's my whole point. into the war you don't know girl you really don't know that's the whole point of the story and how the Hughes brothers set it up. They didn't have to throw in your face. It makes man you ask yourself. Throwing a chair at the judge at the end, like I could never picture him. When you when you give me a movie and uh, I I if I were to just skip to the end of the movie and then go to the beginning, be like, there's how the fuck does that guy end up becoming that guy? But they, in the course of two hours, they take you through a hero's journey Correct. of him becoming this, like, uh, he's kind of like an anti-hero. If, if, I know we didn't cover it. We were supposed to cover the movie, and we didn't, but a soldier story. This truly is a soldier story. And like you say, that's the beautiful part about it to what you were saying from earlier. And I want to keep bringing up the Hughes brothers because they did such an excellent job. You mentioned it. The first 15, 20 minutes before he goes to war, you, I didn't. Say, I won't say it was a stretch of the imagination for his acting because I've seen a lot, of, a lot of his films, but I will say this. I see where you're coming from. You're like, Okay, what, whatever. But it is night and day from, and it, as it should be, when he's in war, he has changed. So what they're probably trying to tell you is, look at what war did to him. Yeah. Without saying it, without propaganda in your face, 
War did that to him. But you see how it's kind of like Ace, because Ace also was like the straight character. He was kind of a little bit more reserved than the supporting roles in the mm -hmm. movie, and all this chaos kind of ensues around him that forces his hand into this situation. That yeah. uh, it was I'll just say similar. this: Ace ran his operation a lot better than uh, <laughs> Anthony. Yeah, we'll get there later. We'll get there later. All right. So yeah, guys. You see what I fucking did? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I got I got a few more okay. talking points here. Okay. Uh, so do I. Go ahead. Kirby. Uh, okay. <laughs> So Kirby would get along really well with Leroy from People Under the Stairs. Oh, yeah. yeah. Shit, fuck the dumb shit. You want to drive a what? <laughs> Maybe the president is going to make me secretary of pussy. It, it, that scene with um, the scene with Kirby and uh, Anthony in the car uh, reminded me a lot of a uh, of, of, of scene stealer, uh, Brandon Quentin Adams and... Uh, and Ving Rhames sitting in the van. Have but, you ever seen a movie where a prosthetic leg is just riding in front of a car? Nobody ma makes mention of it whatsoever. Uh, I, is this there? I have, yeah, that's I have. I, that's I have a note about that for sure. Okay. Um, when uh, when Cowboy pulls the knife on Anthony, it was cracking me up. How he's like, he's got him down, but he like keeps checking to see if Kirby <laughs> can see. Shut your motherfucking mouth, man! I cut you. <laughs> yeah, but it, like I'm an older brother, so I know that look when you're like fucking with your little brother. Oh, he can't even enjoy it all the way because yeah. he's like, <laughs> <laughs> that was, that, dude, he, that he's, was so, he's such a good actor. That, that he, he really is. He really is. Uh, what really fuck, uh, another one of my talking points was again, and we'll get into this later. Like again, most people that have only seen Chris Tucker made them laugh, and that's what I kept telling you when you saw this. You actually get, can see Chris Tucker act, get to act in this film the, oh, when yeah. he at the end when they're getting ready to do the robbery he is nervous as shit across the street smoking that fucking cigarette i would have just knew something was going on he was just and, uh, <laughs> he, uh, there was something really artistic about that shot the placement of him because it seemed like it seemed like that the dirt that he was standing on it was like he was back in the shit in a weird way did you see you notice that shot where it was showed his it just showed his feet and they're in an urban area, but he's standing in this like he's standing on this like dirt mound in the middle of the street, seemingly. Nah, I, I, I would like to give him credit because if they if they actually went that far into detail to where they're not even showing you in his mind he's back in the war, even though he's not, that's beautiful. Just I've like, never noticed just like that. boots on the ground. Yeah, nah, that. It, I'm, I'm thinking it was just there, but if they went that deep, fuck, I don't yeah. think so. There was a. It seemed like there'd be a lot of symbolic imagery being oh, played was. with in this uh, oh, we'll on, a, on a really subtle level. We'll um, when when Cleon goes postal and he lops off the, the dude's head in the war. Oh man, what the fuck? That would have been a perfect Snickers commercial. Uh, the, the the dude literally asks him, "You hungry or something, Cleon?" No. <laughs> Got yours. I'll get mine. <clears throat> you hungry or something, Cleon? Then like 15 minutes later, he's days later in their journey, he's still holding on to that head. And uh, in fairness, he was right. They ain't nobody got a splinter or anything. Yeah, yeah, it's good luck. <laughs> well, and then when he buries it, he's like, we're in a world we're of shit, shit now, now boys. Buried our love. Were they not? We're in a world of shit now. I just buried our luck. The, uh, I mean, Technically, at any moment in the war, shit could have gone wrong. I don't think yeah. that was that was not too coincidental. I really appreciated the line, though, man. It smells like a sack full of assholes. <laughs> Fuck you, man. It stinks like a sack full of assholes. We'll talk about this later, though. But again, it's the exact reverse for, for Cleon. See, he was already in the war since 66. And see how he was when he came home? Yet mm -hmm. again, the war is the common denominator. Keep going. Yeah, we kind of touched on this. That it's fucked up how you go to fight for the country and come back and struggle to survive. And this is what this legitimately pissed me off when uh, when Anthony gets caught. It was such overkill. How many like you saw oh, like all the all the all the like, cops there. Like Not only all the cops people. there, even when he went down to his knee, they're pointing their gun like bro. So, so and they did they even did the overhead shot yeah, to the show really you, yeah, illustrate yeah, yeah. like look how oh they got him covered now. But when he came back from the war and needed help, needed some kind of assistance, like when you go and you fight for your country and you come back and it's like your country doesn't even realize you exist until you commit a crime, then all of a sudden you get a shining example of the resources that they well, have since, available to take care of you. Since we're wearing this makeup, I think it'd only be right to quote Heath Ledger in his role as the Joker when he says, see, if I tell you some gangbanger is gonna do this today, it's all a part of the plan. But as soon as I say this, 
Everybody goes all crazy. That's, why, that's what it is. That's, exactly that's why I was so glad that he flipped out on the judge. Because what he said to the judge was my sentiments exactly after that moment when he got caught. Like, what the fuck, man? This is fucked up. I fought for this country. And he said, I didn't mean for these people to die. Already and he did. 10 years of life. I already gave my life to this country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And fuck then yeah. fucking Martin Sheen, I had a purple heart too. Are we comparing yeah. purple hearts now? Take a fucking, fucking chair. Like, fuck you. Fuck you. He threw that chair. And in fairness, in that, that was a very accurate throw. That was very good. Like, he, he, Martin Sheen jumped out of the way like George. You see that shot of George Bush where the reporter oh, yeah, threw the shoe, the shoe at him? <laughs> <laughs> Could you imagine if somebody threw a shoe at Biden? He'd be yeah. dead. It, yeah, he's it, not moving. He'd fucking kill him. Or even worse, uh, um, our guy. Uh, uh, the mean, the, the, uh, the one for president. The, uh, fought, he was on the front line with King when he was younger. The, I, he was you know, the, the dude, the fucking dude, man. Uh, the politician oh, guy. Uh, John, oh, John. No, no, no. The older one that, that might have died if he would have got elected. Bernie Sanders. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> Old scarf man. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Yeah. God damn it. David. Casting call. Money, 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 money. Money. So before we get into our casting calls, there uh, a few casting calls were made. Oh, Jada Pinkett Smith. Hitting that algorithm. Mm -hmm. She was offered the role of Delilah, but turned it down due to an altercation. What do you say, hitting the rock Baker. or hitting the algorithm? Huh? Hitting the rock or hitting the algorithm? Both. All right. She turned it. She turned down the role of Delilah due to an altercation between Alan Hughes and her longtime friend, Tupac Shakur, on the set of their previous film, Menace to Society, which resulted in Tupac's termination from the production. She's always getting her men, like, kicked out of shit. And... Any, uh, speaking of Menace to Society, the first feature film by the Hughes brothers, Dead Presidents, features five actors from that film, including Lawrence Tate, Clifton Powell, James Pickens Jr., Ryan Williams, and Clifton Collins Jr. When I tell you Clifton Powell killed it in that motherfucker. In Menace? Just, just, yes, he did. I don't think I've seen that one either. Uh, that'll have to go on the, uh, oh, the uh, he made me do it. I, you want you want me to make you do that one, yes, sir. All right, so I I did I did pretty much the main crew with the with the I couldn't figure out a guy for Jose. No, no, no. Well, because I went through I went for like young actors that are like Louis Diamond Phillips. See, he wouldn't have fit that age bracket. I went for actors that were that. Or like if they were to make the movie today. That's oh, okay, I, I got it. Okay, and I, I couldn't, okay. I couldn't okay. come up with a. Today, a, I still got somebody for you. Uh, if we, were, if they were to do it today, Jose, Michael Pena. He's still a little too oh, old. Oh, yeah, I, I yeah, get you. Like, like these today, kids today. just graduated in high school. I just, I just don't, I don't make it a, a habit to know young teen Spanish boys. Same here. Okay. But I did everybody else. So, so who, who do you have for Loren State? For Lorenz Tate, you got to remember, uh, like I say, it, I, I kind of did the same thing you did. If you want to look at it, somebody who's been in the game for a while, who actually has talent, but I can actually see pulling it off. I I, I think we brought him up the other day, but I, for me, it'd be Michael Ealy. I can see Michael Ealy doing this. And the reason why I say that it is, I know he has a dark side because I say but if he, in the movie Taken, Takers, he he, I had never seen him that dark before. That's with T.I. and uh, Idris Elba and everybody. So my point was he would have been able to play that nice part, but that, that turn would have been so you wouldn't see it coming. Like, who's this? It, it, okay, Michael Ely. Sorry, yeah. uh, I did um, Donald Glover for mm. Anthony because I think he could have. I've seen him from like he could go from community to uh hmm. this is america and that's pretty much the transition that anthony takes the huh. transformation that anthony takes in dead presidents oh i like that okay who we got next uh chris tucker skip who you, who you got you say are you doing the same thing today like it was, they were cast today? yeah okay. well, um lamar morris uh new girl uh that woke. new show woke yeah damn that was almost perfect that was that's he's, damn good uh, he's, man he's definitely got the comedic relief uh -huh. going on and i think he has the acting chops to pull off the more dramatic elements of that character too damn it that was that was damn it that was good man oh, like, I, that, I, that's, I, he really is that i don't even, i'm gonna go with you on that one i don't even want to say mine because you know he is really he's in a, also a uh date night he kills mm -hmm. it in date night i mean he is oh, yeah. he's really a funny fucking guy man i, I give it i like that uh, Bokeem Woodbine, Cleon. I did uh, William Jackson Harper. I think they have very similar acting styles. William Jackson Harper is great on the show The Good Place. 
Uh, but he plays that same kind of reserved character. It looks like he might have some demons brewing beneath the surface as well, but he's all, he can also go reserved and petrified and anxious, kind of the way uh, Cleon, Cleon does. Um, Yahya Abdul-Mateen II. That's what I went with for that one. Yeah, he's got the intensity too. Candyman. Sure. After Candyman showed me everything I needed to see, fuck it. And then that, yeah. how he was playing that Morpheus and he was prouncing around and shit, you know what yeah. I'm saying? I can see him cutting off a fucking head. It's like, we're in a world of shit now. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just, I looked at that and I can see him coming back home and being a pastor and handing out $100 bills. Keith David, Kirby. I told that motherfucker I'd rather he'd catch it with a knit needle. I feel like if they were to do this movie right now, this would be the perfect role for Eddie Murphy to remind people that he can do both sides of the fence as far as comedy, drama, intensity. I wouldn't want, I wouldn't fuck that. Now, I, I didn't even pull, pull any punch. I was Samuel Jackson. Samuel Jackson would have done. I, my first instinct was Denzel because he's got the old father figure esque thing going on. But I just see Eddie Murphy being able to nail those lines that Keith David did that made you laugh that weren't really funny on paper. What, what he said, I'm, I'm, I'm bearing the lead here, but he was like, uh, I told you we need another man. That's your punk, motherfucking friend. Yeah. I was like, God damn. Yeah, uh, she, uh, hold on. Oh. He needs his ass kicked. <laughs> need... Hold on. Later. All right, young blood. <laughs> Who, who, who do you see in uh, in Dead Presidents? How would you have casted it? What actors would you have liked to see f fulfill those roles? If they were to make it, um, if they were to do like the Ghostbusters 2016 treatment on this and replace it with a group of women that go to war and come mm. back and- Oh back shit, heist. yeah. You already, you already know I'm rolling with Viola Davis, Vivica Fox. Where's, Fuck where's Tiffany? Tiffany who, Haddish? Yeah. Not on the list. Really? Um, no, nah. I mean, she's okay. She's so hot right now. Council so hot right now. Uh, I mean, who else would I want? I would want my girl. Uh, you, you know, you Lapita Yango. Oh yeah, yeah. Her yeah. and Siri. Shit, both of them coming uh, in. You know where? You know? You know where I could see her perfectly? Under you, right here on my dick. <laughs> All right, we're cutting that part out. Sorry, Lapita. Was a Lapinus joke? Thank you. <laughs> uh, you could lip this dick. Money, money, money. All right, guys, you know what time it is. It's time to talk about our favorite scenes. And I'm going to go ahead and start this one out, Dave. Now, for me, it was the one of the opening scenes of the film was the, I call it the milk truck scene, where you see all of them. Of course, there's a white guy driving. And, uh, and they, like I said, we are the again, everything they, that we can. I think we can now not just assume, but we now know that everything the Hughes brothers was doing was attention to detail. So, again, they could have just showed them in the back of a truck, but they clearly also show they it's so powerful just to see okay there's three minorities riding the back of this truck with a white man driving meaning that it not to say oh go to the back but it just it puts you in the mindset of what time they're in right now but the reason why i love that that's, and again they don't harp on it it's exactly. a subtle detail that you have to pick up on perfect perfect yes sir so the, to me the one thing i loved about this uh scene because again I like films that teach, and meaning this is a time capsule piece, meaning that kids now wouldn't understand this, and even I almost didn't understand when I watched it when younger for the first time, but you have three minorities discussing their future during a time where to be drafted meant something totally different. To be drafted now, you're like, oh shit, mama, we going to the NBA, we going to the NFL. Back then, there was literally, you're complaining about wearing a face mask. Imagine a world where you were literally put into a lottery to be drafted, like, hey, you might be going to the military if your number comes up. Shit, with all this stuff happening with Russia and Ukraine, you might not have to imagine that world too much longer. There you go. I'm glad we're over the barrier of fighting for it. Where I, oh, between yeah. between your, <laughs> yeah. your my liver and your lungs, we're gonna be good, no good for anybody here. So we're. Uh, yeah. I'll, I will I will Kirby my own way <laughs> to get the fuck out of that draft. Get hey, the fuck off a of spider. It's not it's not our war. Yeah yeah. There you go. We're in the real war. <laughs> yeah. According to Martin Sheen's. Yeah, the the war, was, did you what did you think about that scene? Did you notice that or what did you think about that? I know. No, that was uh that was a great opening scene. It was like uh I didn't I didn't even pick up on the fact that it was a white guy driving up front. That's how that's how like un, 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 under un, the nose it's background. Did that. It's background fodder. It's not like but, hey because we all know that that we all know that time and place right. and the and like the bullshit that comes with it. So like to and not bog the movie down with those details, but to have them there for authenticity, that's really cool. To me, because again, I just again just want to uh, nail down one more point to our audience out there who may not be familiar with this and who may say, I don't get the point. Why do you have to bring up the fact that it was a white guy driving? It's not the fact that it was a white guy driving, like he says. It just shows you the time that was going on. They could have had three white people in the back of the truck. That's not how that operated back then. Hey, Dan's been here for a while. Dan's driving. He's not going to be back in the back handing out milk. What does he look like? Get somebody else. Get that spick and those niggas to do it. 
Yeah, and it's yeah. weird. And but then you had like the flip side of that, where you have the you had like the the liberal white class of America, like Saul, who run the book ran the butcher shop, mm-hmm. who's who's like you would in that time and place when he was going in to get that job. I expected that scenario to go, go completely very differently. Different. Yeah. yeah. And then like, down to the point where he had to close down the shop, and he's given him the last of the the, the last of the food that they couldn't sell. Um, it was cool that they showed both sides of the equation, it like, did, and it without seemed, showing it. Yeah, and yeah. between him and Saul, hey, they cut the fat. Mm-hmm. See what I did there? Even when they were like you like you were talking about when they were at the uh, when they were in Vietnam, and the white dude um, was like, you know, cut, get that bullshit out of here, like. Right. We don't like he didn't we're see color. We're all in this. Together. We're all in the shit together here. Right. We're I, all the same. I've been walking around right with here. a motherfucker carrying a head. Don't tell me I see color. Like he was yeah. like, nah, we're just yeah. Although that, I feel like that might be glossing over a part of history that like that like not doing the uh, the injustice of that part of history enough justice because I, I'm pretty sure that there was like it wasn't equal in the military over there. I mean, maybe you know? maybe once you break off into these like smaller sex but of that's like what made it beautiful they didn't show the bureaucracy of reporting back to this person that yeah. this is their unit he's in the shit it's his story yeah Go. well, he's got yeah. my back i got his i don't well, care well everybody didn't have is. everybody back Co- yeah, hey cover true. me <laughs> friendly fire yeah yeah, yeah. okay we'll Whoops. get it whoopsie your, your turn sir uh the one of the one of the opening scenes for me too when uh kirby has anthony take him on a run pull over here I just, I love that whole scene. What did you think they were going? What did you think that meant when he said, come on around with me? Oh, I absolutely knew that it was something crime related because he gave him money first. Yeah. It's for you. Well, he he wanted to make sure that he had him in his pocket before he went and did this shit. But you want to go on a run? Like when an old man gives you money and then asks if you want to go, go on a run with him. You go. Yeah. Or you don't. (laughs) I mean, it, well, depending on the man, but, but there is a relationship. So there, between so your yeah. prior relationship, right? Yeah. But that whole scene was really great. Like, you want to drive? Who me? No, not me. You motherfucker. <laughs> Kirby, I got my. You want to drive or not, motherfucker? <laughs> yeah. I, I love the dynamic between them two. Keith David is always. You could great. tell he saw a uh, uh, saw a little bit of him and Anthony, and he didn't want Anthony to wind up like him. Yeah. I mean, he's like, whoa, Nelly, and that what you call her, Nelly? I'll call this bitch whatever I want to call her. <laughs> What you call it, Nelly? <laughs> Come on, Nelly. <laughs> I call this bitch whatever I want. All the way down to you got more soul than your old man. Right before he knocks the bitch no. out cold. Now you say you got more heart than your old oh. man. I'll tell you that. Yeah, he did knock that bitch out cold. <laughs> when it cut to the wide shot, she is not even moving on the ground. Like, she took so the we don't rest. even know if she's dead or not. <laughs> yeah, like put her down. And then at the same moment. You grabbed the wrong leg, you cocksucker. You grabbed the wrong leg, you stupid but, cocksucker. But uh, it's the shot after that. They back when, all the way up down the street to let you see him like. But what, what killed me about that scene what, what was the icing on the cake is when Keith David falls to the, the ground, ground. He shimmies it. himself over to hold the guy at gunpoint. my money, motherfucker. Yeah, like I never thought I would see another man holding somebody at gunpoint on the ground. I want my motherfucking money here. And then, oh no, I lied. The real, uh, the cherry on top of the icing on the cake is when they get back in the car and he's like, I've done this I know, before. I know you, you felt this. Like, where the fuck am I? I ought to kill that. I ought to kill that bastard. What, what happened, Kirby? What happened? Motherfucker made me lose a whole pack of cigarettes. Motherfucker made me lose a whole pack of cigarettes. And every 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 cigarette smoker in America felt that at that time. He does not pack. care about all the money that he just got. He can go the buy cigarettes. a cart and like had an open. Pa- I can't have a cigarette right now to enjoy what just happened. Yeah, yeah. By the city, though, I got a bad motherfucker. Yeah, you grabbed grab the wrong one. <laughs> <laughs> that, right, uh, uh, that threw me off too because I did. I, I love that they waited until that moment to let us know that uh, one of Kirby's legs was, was a false not real. leg, and you yeah. didn't know it until then. But it was such a great reveal. And did they ever explain that? Because well, no, no, in the war, he said it. He okay, said it, yeah, and that's, that's why I say he figure. saw something to Anthony and him. It happened in the war. Yeah. What, like, so essentially, he his story played out like again, yet again, they're not throwing it in your face. This man fought for his country in uh, allegedly the real war. Martin Sheen was talking about, but still came back home and had to hustle. But we'll mm-hmm. get into that later. So yeah, very good, sir. Um, the, one of my other favorite scenes was graduation night. Now we've discussed this before, um, and I didn't learn this until later on in filmmaking. But the Hughes brothers did an amazing job with it. I, I mean, it you see black people in red and green in there. Now, it's not just the Africa thing. I'm not saying that. Not, no, no, I, 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 I'm not saying I, that. I just, I have that. I have that in my, what would I change? I just, well, I wouldn't change that at all because again, now 
because again, I've told you this before. It was a strong artistic choice. So it you was. Could, you should definitely expect different opinions. Correct. Because everybody's not going to look at that and and, and and see the same thing. Yeah. I loved it. I, I love. Put it this way: when I first saw the movie when I was a kid, I didn't know. I didn't know any different, so I wouldn't know why I would love it. I was just like, it's an artistic choice. But as, well, do you think that that was a like a red color gel over lights, or do you think that was post production that that created that effect? Put it this way: it could have been done better, a lot. But I'll say that. So with that being said, I think it was a gel. I don't yeah, think that too. it was done in post. And I think it was a gel. Yeah, because you could tell because behind them, it wasn't like as, it, it as was, strong. Yeah. So it had to be a gel. But my point was, I knew what they were going for. They were going for that certain darker toned skin people. No, and that's not just black. You can be darker toned. It, it's, you can light it like this light is on me now. But if you change the light and you get it right with the aperture and everything and f-stop, it the skin illuminates now. Like the skin is popping off, off the screen versus how it looks now. So they knew that. I just don't think they had enough technical. Now I ain't gonna say they didn't have the skill. I'm pretty sure somebody guy was on like, no nah, man, trust me, it's gonna play. It's gonna play. Yeah. And they put the gel on there. Jose was glowing so Like much. a motherfucker. He looked like he was on a green screen. <laughs> I saw like a, like a little hair hairline glow around him. It was crazy looking. Yeah, it was just, that, that was just a little, uh, I knew what they were going for. It was still too murky looking for, murky, for my yeah. taste. They reminded me of like movies that, and nothing against Chad Hendricks, but he would blast some color gels like crazy on it, like in early 2000s. And it just, uh, I think that's why it just like, it, I mean, I guess same time frame. So. It was a time frame, because think about now, nine days, That's that could have been done easily. Mm -hmm. That's an easy light setup and it would have been done. But again, I know what they were going for for A forever. Yeah, I, I mean the scene itself was oh, great. Oh yeah, the, the, between the dot that my hands still hurt. <laughs> yeah, you give away my pussy, I'll kill. All right. <laughs> um, the uh, I had two favorite scenes. So the first one was Kirby and Anthony on the run, and then the uh, the second one was the, of course the heist scene. Because I thought it was really cool how you wait the whole movie for this moment, and by the time you get to them that moment, you almost forget they were going to rob somebody. Yeah, and and it, and and it comes and goes so quickly, and you never really get like a premonition about the face paint. It just kind of is Camels there. comes out of nowhere. Yeah, you don't, like, you're like, not getting it done. Like it was like, God damn, this is some yeah. good. Yeah, I, and I and I just I like how the whole movie is this like slow burn to this. 10 minute moment where everything goes. just escalates so quickly. such a range of emotions happening from like i'm cracking up at jose and his excitement <laughs> over the fucking pot he doesn't even care about the money he doesn't care about the money you see that, that doors explosion? came off yeah oh my god i gotta strike got he's running to the other guy not to tell him to get out of there to come witness mm -hmm. the magnificence um and then like the uh uh, uh the 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 slow tension that that builds between officer brown and cleon hey, when, and we'll be talking to officer brown later but remember what, what does he say let me check for you no need to go to any trouble officer no 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 trouble at all brother ain't that for me to help a fellow love that yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And it was almost like he knew what was going on, but he was just cat and mouse in him. But I, I don't, I don't think that because he really did seem legitimately blindsided when shit went south. And then, but what about the awkwardness of that moment too? Where he was like, he was like, hey, uh, like you waiting on a bus or something? He was like, yeah. He's like, I'm waiting on. It. I caught it here the exact same time yesterday. He's like, you sure? Yeah. Almost like, hey, bitch, I'm. Yeah. Yeah. You might want to. Stop. And, and I was waiting for him to say, like, listen, I don't know what y'all finna do. I wasn't even gonna fuck with you, but your partner across the street, like, if you wouldn't even look down the dead like that, and you see smoke, you see us. Skip over these. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. bet if you look down, it was a mound of cigarettes down. There. Um, I, and I, uh, I like like they they did a really good job at at conveying the gravity of the fucked up parts of that situation, like when the sister gets shot. Mm -hmm. That was uh, I couldn't imagine um what Anthony was feeling Correct, in that moment. Because he got her into it. Yeah. That's his daughter's and, 19. Like, I'm, I can't leave her. Well, you're not leaving her. She's already gone. That was a, that was a right. great line. 
Perfect. And again, they showed the level because he's been going crazy this whole time and without any explanation. And she's already gone. Like, God but damn. What made that scene my favorite scene over all that was uh, Jose. Because if you remember when they're driving around earlier with Kirby. Put the goddamn thing away. With your little pyromaniac ass. You're going to be walking in a minute. Oh, cool out, Kirby, man. I'm not going to burn your car. Not yet, at least. And he meant that shit because, and I was, wait, when he said that line then, I was like, oh, he's going to fuck his car up during the heist. And it got to the heist and he fucked it up. Royally, like he didn't. I thought maybe he wreck it, or maybe oh, no, no, like the, he the dump truck hit it. The dump truck hit it, and then it Jose explode, exploded it. Thing. Yeah, that's what it was. Because <laughs> and you know it was part. Because again, don't, and don't get, okay, we'll get to that. But that was part. Yeah, that was that was, yeah. that was a real that was really good storytelling. That was a great script writing right there. You, I know you said those are your favorite scenes, but I'm gonna mention some of these, and I guarantee you're gonna be like, you know what? Okay, okay, you brought this up earlier, and I knew I didn't think you were gonna catch it, but it, well, actually, I knew you would catch it because you're a man, and all, every man catches it. It's like it's like, hey, Cuddy, I want to introduce you to. Honey, I want you to meet Anthony. Like by the time she said that he was around the corner, yeah. and it was just kind of like, it's 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 like again, they they did such a good job without even without saying stuff when saying it. Those two men had no conversation at that time, but at that time, Anthony knew that Cuddy had fucked and fucked well and yeah. hard and, and long. I felt the jealousy in that moment. And the fucked up thing is, it was probably. 30% the fact that he was fucking her. Hey, baby girl. <laughs> yeah. So he's laying out 200. That, I thought that, it was 100. She was like. That's the 70% that was fucking with Anthony <laughs> right there. Like, he's got money that I can't get. I can't do this for her. Like, I got a dick. I could dick her. Mm -hmm. I can't money her. He's got, he has something on him. And that that's fucked up. And then and the fact it, that he's in the, and that sets up the dominoes so perfectly for Anthony's character to to back him into the corner. What's the other thirty percent is that she's fucking a motherfucker that's sucking a blow pop in front of my fucking face right now? <laughs> yeah. Oh God, yeah. And the close up said that. Dude, that <laughs> that's actually a connection to Keith David in Requiem for a Dream because he plays a very similar slimy sleaze type of character, uh, not, but like Cuddy. Goddamn uh, Cuddy. <laughs> yeah. Goddamn Cuddy. So that was one of the give. Oh, oh, my, oh. The, listen, this song has been used a, a billion times. The James Brown estate is probably still living off the money to pay back. But it was also perfectly timed when the, the, the rematch. Hey, Craig, it's time for the rematch. When this motherfucker, uh, Lorenz Tate, uh, pl uh, plays uh, Terrence Howard again in that second game of pool. Yeah. Say, man, why you got to talk shit? See, that's why I kicked his ass when he was a little kid. See, man, why the fuck you always got to talk some shit? Hey, but it's okay, man. Hey, man, hey, what you looking? You got that fine ass Juanita. Hey, man, don't look at me like that. I'm just paying you compliments on your taste. <laughs> but yeah, no, no, no. It's all good, man. But hey, word is, baddest motherfucker this side of Nicky Bonds. You should tap that ass while you was opening up. Cut the coming America scene now. <laughs> oh yeah, and he broke his ass. Oh, and that's yeah. when what, what what did Kirby say? Nah, let him get it. Let him get it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He needs his. He's been needing he an needed ass the ass for a long. And he beat the shit out of Terrence Howard. We ain't seen Terrence Howard since. <laughs> I mean, he beat the shit, living shit out of Terrence. That yeah. I know they talk about black on black crime, but in our community, that's red on red crime. Two light skinned brothers just going that on the ground. That's why dark skinned guy was like, Nah, let him get it. Let yeah. him. Get it. And that situation, one times one, did equal one. He did find a straight line directly. Oh so like my that, that, god! That and this, you know, the beautiful part. Is if you can go back and screenshot that one line when they pull him up, you see how he's bit like <laughs> he looked like Jesus coming off the cross when they pulled Jesus' yeah. lifeless body off down. He wanted there. more, and, he, and what he ended, and then, no, and to show how crazy uh Jose is, he gets on top of him like call back to the, the like the Friday. flash of the Friday. He was like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Let me go, Kirby. Let me go. You already beat him. Come on now. Oh, yeah. And then, oh, then Anthony says. And that's game, motherfucker. <laughs> yeah, somebody needs to do a super cut of yeah. uh, Jose leaning over him and then like uh, just cue the audio and you got knocked the, the fuck, fuck out. out. He beat the shit out of him. So yeah, that was that was one of my favorite ones. Um also uh um okay, now we talked about this uh again with Cuddy. Um and, and, and this and you have to understand, this is my brother's favorite fucking scene of what of all times and favorite fucking lines of all the time. And we and him talk about it all the fucking time. It's the fact that, okay. Granted, you have to even his even uh, even she said Juanita says it. I had a life when you was gone, 
And furthermore, she didn't say, I don't know how many times you got your dick sucked or what you fucked over there. She ain't saying that she's like, I had a life. And they were like, all right, all right, cool. So that's normal. So, and don't get me wrong, Cuddy wasn't supposed to show up after that, but he does. And he when he's leaving, he's walking out and he was like, <laughs> Hey, young blood. Hey, man. I ain't gonna lie to you. I care about Juanita. I care about Sarah too. You know what I'm saying? And I laid a little bit of money on him. And at that point, he didn't hear shit else Cuddy said. But point being is Cuddy was like, nah, I, I, I was around, you back, I'm gone. He genuinely meant that shit. He, no, he meant yeah, it, bro. No, I, I, he, I was he, on his side in that moment. And I would have been more on his side. I would have been more on his side in that moment had that scene in the car and I have like, how are you going to drive off and not even let the man he get wasn't he, oh, he, he wasn't ready yet. He wasn't ready. He wasn't ready to accept the, the, the that, fact. Yeah, that, that he was back. He didn't know who he, he, he must, somebody must have told him that's old boy. Oh, yeah, because he was showing up probably with a hard he, dick. Yeah, he said, he said, I came to see you earlier. Yeah. All right, that's sad. Yeah. Like, like he, he was feeding so so, for it. Yeah, yeah, so he, he didn't he know. Had to, he had to go and process it before he can come back. And then he didn't trip. He was like, I care about them. I laid some money. He didn't trip, but somebody tripped and fell down the stairs. He, not, not, he's, he's like, stay the fuck away from my family. What you say to me? I never bite the hand, the hand that feeds you. you. And he told him, open up, Santa Claus. And all that other he's Which, and, bite the hand that feeds you is a great line in this movie because that's exactly, that's the whole movie is biting the hand that feeds. Uh, Anthony goes, puts his life on the line for the country. The country bites his hand when he gets back. Yes, uh, definitely, 100%. And if you notice, like I said, even in that same scene, the, the one thing that, my, like, I already, I, so I'm already reserving. I, I don't know what I would change about the film, but I know what my brother would because he he made me think about this years ago. He's like, you know what? After everything that motherfucker did, how the fuck did he not go back and kill Cuddy? Come on, I got a present for you. Suck it. You know what I'm saying? Like, you done did all this. You done rob. You done beat the shit out of Cowboy. Because remember, buddy, that was uh, a cut, uh, Cowboy w w worked under Cuddy. He said, he said, my boss man Cuddy. Well, that was like, maybe because I think that was some, because that was some petty shit. And what? like once, but like once he was done with his girl, right? Then it was like he's somewhere. Oh no, 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 no! He owed him for that little. Uh, I used to love bringing home the groceries, making feel like a man. <laughs> like he owed him for that shit. That yeah. open up Santa Claus, suck it, <laughs> suck it. You know what I'm saying? And he cries when he says like, "Kill me, kill me, motherfucker, shoot me right now." Cause at that point he it wasn't that he just did that it was the whole world coming down on him mm -hmm. he like he just lost my job you probably just fucked her i don't know what's going on and he drinking all the time they suddenly showed him drinking bit by bit more and more and more he didn't really smoke yeah. that much but he and she kept saying anthony you're drinking this that and the other so that guy said that was that that damn cutty man uh make sure i didn't have oh any. man well the scene right after that when he like puts his arms or, or puts his hands around her neck silly ass neck shut the fuck up shut the fuck up you don't know girl I thought that was oh uh, yeah that was really brave. intense that was brave storytelling because she's too. pregnant well, that, yeah i mean even if she wasn't to have like the hero of the story right anti-hero you said in, it in that light like, but remember he didn't beat her he just choked her and i'm not saying that it's right i'm definitely not i'm not going sean connery on you here no i'm but not I, I thought i mean i'm not saying like it was perfect and perfectly in line with the character that i mean you hear about that like domestic violence mm -hmm. with veterans that come home that they can't separate that that part of their brain anymore and when they get pushed or when somebody came up it, it started it, it triggered him when he she came up behind him and like startled him and then like don't you ever put your hands that you're 100 yeah, percent right about that because he did try to walk away but one thing i think that the hughes brothers did amazingly they sh it's listen. I women come in all shapes, sizes, and colors, and, and demographics. So I'm pretty sure there's certain ways certain women do things. What the Hughes brothers did perfectly. If you did not know how a black woman gets on a black man's ass about some shit coming on, when she told that motherfucker, he was like, "Oh man, I'm gonna wheel us a, a baby boy." Well, can you wheel yourself a job? And, and a real work, job. I, I, He's I, already I, working. Yeah. So, so my thing was just like. Again, I'm not saying she was, she did what she was saying she needed to say, but not right then. Here's a good family fucking moment. He's trying to get it together. And she was happy. And all of a sudden she was like, well, could you wheel yourself a job? You know I'm going to be five months down. I'm like, God damn, I know it's true. But but so my point is they showed the dynamic of how he tried to leave a couple of times. He still was wrong for putting his hands on her, but she kept on him. Like you going on here, you're waking up in them nightmares. And that's when he got mad. Like, you don't know what the fuck I went through over there. Well, I, I, I like that. I like that whole scene. What I did not like is is that five minutes after that, he's at the Black Panther rally making twinkle eyes as at his sister. sister as if something didn't happen. But he said it suddenly, I'm done with your sister. He, he, was, <laughs> done, he was done as soon as he saw her, her up there. He was like, she had a tight body, no kids. She was ready to get it. Yeah. But the way he's like, like, 
I, did I you not I feel a little face off feel when he, he, he was hugging her when she was dead at the oh, end? Like, yeah, we was gonna take care of them. Yeah. Uh, that's my theory. They was gonna kidnap Sarah and go live their life out somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, man. So th those are. Um, oh no. Oh shit. No. Oh, so we we already did the whole damn robbery. The fastest. I heard of the six million dollar man. Kirby is the fastest one legged man ever. How he got at that car when that truck was coming and got the. Motherfucker. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that shit was amazing. He should have been, god damn. Uh, uh, oh yeah, uh, oh yeah. Anthony got everybody fucking killed. He what? He he's the worst fucking planner of a fucking thing. And if you notice, he was the one that was like, if you, when they show that fucking robber, every time he's like, oh, he's looking all over the place to make sure the shit going on, and that's why he keep getting fucked up. The cops talk. I'm like, you're a fuck. What are you doing, Ant? Yeah. That is a horrible planning. I should have knew it when you had the quarter on that fucking. Bullet, whatever that uh, blueprint map. Like, Skip gonna be over here. He gonna be over here. I think we need another man. I'm gonna get one of them. Oh, fuck no. Nah. I want one of them brothers from the revolution coming up in this motherfucker. The fact that they got away with any money after, after, after uh, everything Jose that went burned wrong. the shit. Well, yeah. Just everything going wrong. Like 300,000. Uh, nothing went as planned and they still made out pretty well. This is what this is what uh this is what uh kind of got me. They was like, we gonna give Jose his cut. It looked like Jose had his cut. I seen yeah. a bunch of money hit that fucking wall. <laughs> yeah. And I just want to make this very clear. If I didn't say this earlier, Anthony is a horrible planner at robberies. Like he might have been in, in the reconnaissance unit, but he was not an in intelligence. I'm gonna tell you that right now. The whole plan was fucked up. We ain't do shit right out there, man. And the worst, and again, I, I understand they had to improvise. I really do because the uh, like as to your point, he did blow up Kirby's car. Why the fuck are y'all running on 45th and Harlem where everybody, nobody scattered when a different place, y'all all running on the main street. Yeah. You got fucking um, somebody going Team Wolf on top of the cars. I think it's Anthony. And yeah. furthermore, bitch, that, oh, I'm glad I rebrought this. Thank you. So let me get this straight. I, I, I know it was a surprise us to see them in the makeup, but everybody knew what the wardrobe was. Mm -hmm. And if, I will say this, if I was at the wardrobe meeting, I'd have been like, well, I want to switch my role because I do want to be one of the people to wear the paint. If I'm gonna die, I want to die like this. With that being said, that's just what Anthony got. So um, let me get you straight. If if somebody called in the description, like, man, uh, yes, I just want to report a rock I've seen these people shoot these people. Man, what's going on? Um, It's a bunch of people in black and white face paint and, uh, and they're all wearing black. But no, no. One of them has on a brown suede leather jacket. Like, yeah. like, what the fuck are you doing, bro? Yeah. Huh? Hans, booby, I'm your brown knight. Why the fuck do you have on this nice brown leather jacket? Everybody else in all black. You're throwing out. You know I ought to say somebody. She's like, bro, you want to take the jacket off? Or, yeah. Like, you're, 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 like, they can tell us from the difference from everybody else. Yeah. yeah. Where did it come from? <laughs> Hughes Brothers, please. Money, 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 money. Money. Uh, when, when Skip, right in the very beginning, when they're in the van, I'm not fighting a white man's war. Then be it. This, this reminded me of you. My number one. You're trying. No, my number one. Shit, them VA Kongs, Chungs, whatever the fuck ain't done shit to me. Yeah, so exactly. It, remind, it reminded me of you being culturally inaccurate when we try to pronounce things uh, where he's like, Viet Cong, Chong, whatever the fuck, I ain't done shit to me. I don't even know them motherfuckers, man. Miyamoto, Makasashi. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There you go. But I'm, I'm just, it's funny that we both had that as the very first thing that stood out to us. But I thought that was cool when, like, the first scenes you get with, uh, with Chris Tucker... I was like, oh, okay. He's going to be Chris, Chris Tucker. Tucker. Nope. But then, whoo, man. Nope. I'll get into that. Like, and again, it starts. He does not, but he doesn't not become Chris Tucker until that moment where he freezes. And here's the thing: when, when he come, when the the first time I realized it oh, was the, when he's sitting outside the barbershop, shop, like fucked up on heroin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Man, look who's back in the motherfucking world. But if you notice, uh, see, here's the thing. They never, and again, they don't speak about it. We think he freezes up in war because he just didn't want to be in war. That's when that shit could have already started fucking with him in war. Like he is, it's affecting his blood cells and everything. You don't know. Mm -hmm. So, okay. So that was, that was very good. Uh, I was born in a pussy. I'm going to die in a pussy. That's all right, motherfucker. I was born by the pussy. I die by the pussy. Don't worry about what the fuck I do. <laughs> Who, well, that, that was Chris Tucker. That was good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He was like, man, she was like, he was like, man, you got fucking these girls. They're going to burn you. I don't give a fuck. He, he didn't say it, but I'm a boy. I'm, that's hey. actually look, uh, a favorite line on your behalf. I was born by the pussy. I will die by the pussy. Don't worry about what the fuck I do. That's going to be, I found the title of your biography when I tell your story. Thank you. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I love it. I love it. Oh, yeah. Uh, when when uh, uh when he was like, uh, when Keith, Keith da uh, damn it. What's, what's his last name? Thorman, Keith Davis. Uh, but uh, I think we need another man. We might well put a motherfucking ad in the paper then. We're going to get everybody. Yeah, he was not having that splitting that money like that. Uh, 
I love uh, it when um we kind of brought this up too when Cleon shoots the guy in the back of the head. Now you're good. Now Jesus loves you. What what makes that line so great is the timing of it. How it comes directly after the 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 voiceover about his dad being a preacher, mm -hmm. and then it, it cuts to him saying that line just in time, like the juxtaposition of like this is what a preacher's son acts like in war. Mm -hmm. He still got he still has the religious elements to him. Uh, they're just severely twisted and skewed in the context of where they're at. Uh, one of the things that I, one of the my favorite lines that happens kind of towards the beginning of the film where Anthony tells his family he decides to, he's going to go to the military because I, I know you've been an older brother and you've been outspoken about certain things in the past. Maybe you're, you've changed how you feel, but I just knew it reminded me of you because the brother finds out his younger brother's going to go to the military. He's like, you're an idiot. You know that? And he, yeah. just, he just gets oh. up and walked away. I said that to my brother. Uh, so, so you resonated Tyler, with him. Yeah, who was go? He was going into the military. I said those exact words to him. You are a fucking idiot. You're going. To, what? You're going to go and fight some rich man's war and die for a country that won't even. So that yeah. Another loose connection in that scene was they don't say he becomes a doctor, but they lean heavily towards that uh, his brother went to school to become a doctor, mm -hmm. and apparently he followed that path and wound up on Grey's Anatomy. Uh, another one of the line we kind of, I kind of said it before, but again, Keith Davis says, uh, 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 no, no, Skip tells him, uh, Chris Tucker tells him. I told you we need another man. And Keith Davis, without hesitation, looking, I, he kind of gave me that Craig T. Nelson feel from uh, Blaze. He looks up and says. That's y'all's motherfucking punk ass friend. Like I, I just remember, I, I, cause I, I have that experience with my brother. Like my brother's older than me; he's eight years older than me, and he doesn't hang out with me and my friends. But he's been around me and my friends before, and he'll and it's something to go crazy. He'd be like, "That's your fucking friend." <laughs> like, yeah, you are right. Yeah, he is my it's my my cross to bear. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, the what? Uh, oh, when Anthony comes back from the war, and. Uh, and his mom is grilling him at the table about you pick up any bad habits. He's like, killing just, just killing people for my country, country of course. course. No bad habits, ma. Except for a little killing. For my country, of course. <laughs> like, that makes it okay. That goes fun. back to, like, growing up in church. That was always, like, a point of contention between, like, I thought killing's wrong. Well, not if it's state-sanctioned. Mm. Then, yeah. then God looks the other way. Yeah. If you're killing for another piece of land, then yeah. you're good in God's eyes for your country. Now again, and there were so many great lines in this film. We'd be here all day if we went over all the lines. But again, I, I want to make sure that one of the lines- Oh, that, does she fuck you? Make you feel like a man. Make you feel real good. Huh, boy? Then she wasn't doing it like that before you went to the war now, was she? And that's why he that had to go back and kill that line motherfucker. cuts to the fucking bone. Core. Because in that moment, I'm like, Oh shit, he is right. That was an and that and that went back and made that awkward fuck scene, which was until that point kind of like, why are my sh why are they showing all of this so long? You got other story to tell. No, they I don't. get it. It's <laughs> awkward, but then it made sense because then you you draw back to that moment like, man, she really she had no experience in the sack, and he comes back to this vixen. What the <laughs> fuck happened? Cuddy happened, and so it's even more because remember he said they said quickly early he was like, man, I did two tours. Cuddy did a lot more. So while yeah. you're at your two tours, and in fairness, he said, he said, he looks up and said, man, I used to give, get a thank you for that type of thing. <laughs> but he was right. But yeah, again, like yeah. you say, he went around the corner, he processed, and he generally meant it. You back? No, I'm he, no. in that, before he threw him down the stairs, from that, in that moment. He didn't throw him down. He cocked his ass and he fell down the stairs. The same way old girl got cocked earlier. But he was winning me over for a moment. And that exchange <laughs> right before that happened, I'm like, all right. You know, oh you know, Anthony, stop being a little bitch about this. Yeah. Just fucking man up, take the money, mm -hmm. lose the ego. What you think I'm fucking him? You gotta be so I ain't fucking him. Not right now, you're not. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, show Uncle Cuddy some respect. <laughs> Just think of me as a friend of the family. Yeah. That's when it was too much. You were like, you need to you find yourself short for some cash. Yeah. I, yeah. I front you. I let, he didn't say I'd give it to you. He said I'd front you, meaning you pay me back. Yeah. But I, in fairness, he, he was right. We don't need his money. And and really, he you know what he means by pay him back. Get your anyway, wife you can. over here to, to get anyway, sucking you can. and fucking. Tell Sarah I want to see her. Money, 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 money. Money. Dave? Yo. This next segment is going to be bittersweet. Uh... Is we when we started this show, we wanted to make sure that when we discuss these films, a lot of people like all films aren't nominated for Oscars or Tonys and stuff like that. So because we are the 
producers, creators and of our own show, we get to give our own Oscars and we call our Oscars for our people, the scene stealers, you know, and we've had some great scene stealers over the, uh, over the seasons. And what's important is, is that we didn't go with the status quo or the trend. We just didn't choose people because, oh, listen, Scorcher 9, Tug Speedman. Mm -hmm. Like, we're not picking those people. We picked the people that stood out to us, and it's been like, time. Oh, we need more females on the board, or, right. oh, this board isn't culturally representative. Of, like, the no. movie dictates We watched the it. movie. We like this person the most. Very much if so. If anything, sometimes we disqualify Qualify the A-lister because they're too much of a shooter. We did that with, uh, we did with, uh, Blaze, with uh, of Blaze of Glory. Yeah, so uh, Dave, we're going to go, me and Dave are going to take you back through our season and three scene stealers and we started the season with of course dave joker that got walking phoenix up there messing me on the telly the invention of lying jennifer gardner crazy isn't it <laughs> howard the duck chip zion and david represented the wrong man candy man yaya abdul mateen the second the people under the stairs brandon quentin adams the dog whisper as he sent that dog at Vin Rames. Uh, Ghostbusters trilogy minus the women. Rest in peace, Harold Ramis. Die Hard. Rest in peace, Alan Rickman. And rest in peace, Bruce Willis's acting career, sir. You've, you've, given, you've done us well. The Matrix quadrilogy, Neil Patrick Harris and Lawrence Fishburne. The French Dispatch, Torture. Jeffrey Wright. I'll have a slice. Being there, Peter Sellers. Studio 666. Oh, come on. What? Give it to me. Studio C. No, Peter Sellers. Which line am I looking for from being there? Just give me one line. You know which line I'm looking for. Out of all the lines. Do you like the watch? No, that's close. Not sexual. I'm drawing a few huge blank. That's close. The last word is close. If you add a letter to it. He told me to come find some black guy named Raphael. Uh, uh -oh. <laughs> He still hasn't found Raphael, by the way. Do Sorry. you know Raphael? <laughs> He's a black man. Studio 666 got Rami Jaffe on the board. And we want to rest in peace, too. Mr. Taylor 5317 Hawkins. Yeah, man. I'm glad I got to see his work before he left us, unfortunately. Uh, face off, Nicholas Cage, a.k.a. Caster fucking Troy, a.k.a. Archer. Yeah. Sean Archer. 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 Here you go. And of course, Blaze of Glory, Craig T. Nelson, coach. All right. That gets us into Dead Presidents. I've got quite the fucking few honorable mentions. Mm. Let's go back and forth with the honorable mentions. You start with your first one, brother. Keith David, Kirby. I, I like Keith David as an actor. I've, I've enjoyed him and everything he's in. I think, I can't think, every scene that Kirby, uh, that Kirby oh, he was owns. in. Yeah, he was he great. Owns. And he's got that, he's got that sexy chocolate voice. I mean, like I gotta say that it one is I, I, even to the end when he when he was like run young blood y'all y'all he's he thinks he's captain <laughs> like he's a yeah. fucking no he he definitely killed it man and like I say he could have easily been a scene stealer like I say I mean because he he de definitely demanded and owned every scene he had. some of his best work again is at that goddamn table doing the planning of the heist and the counting of the money if you motherfuckers make me lose count one more time I'm gonna <laughs> shoot me a motherfucker we gonna split it four ways yeah <laughs> uh, all right one of my um one of my honorable mentions was uh Bakeem Woodbine. I loved it just like with the, just like what we just talked about with Keith David. He owned every scene he was in. And here's the thing, you think that that's it almost you don't think after they leave the war, you don't think you will ever see him again. I think Clean Cobra, you think that's it, that's gone. Boom. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden we need another man. And then they go, and then and, and this is the beautiful part. We didn't even talk about it. It should have been one of our favorite scenes. They're discussing the robbery in church after he just delivered a sermon. Yeah. And then and he delivers one of the most classic lines ever. He's like, I don't even think I should take this money. And they were like, well, you ain't gonna be like, no, 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 I want the money. Well, I mean, you know, some of the greatest robberies of all time happen in church. This is true. I mean. I know more than most. I, I know, I know. <laughs> You're hot under those lights, isn't it, Seinfeld? <laughs> no? <coughs> um. Bokeem Woodbine was uh, was an honorable mention for me, too, as well. Again, I, I liked him a lot. The big hit it was cool to see him in this. He's great in everything he's in. Uh, he's actually in Spider-Man. Uh, it's one of the homes. He was in. Uh, I didn't realize that Donald Glover was in that. Uh -huh. and they're, they're he's a Miles Morales' uh, uncle. Crazy. Yeah. Um, crazy, crazy world. He he's also he's also great in the season of uh, Fargo that he was in. Yeah. And um, 
the did you ever see the show uh Southland with Regina Taylor? I have. I haven't seen all of it, but I know he's in there. He, he's he just is, he's, he's a very really good put it this way, again, he is one of the most underrated actors out there. We use that word out, but he's yeah, seriously no, underrated. He's serious, yeah, yeah, because he has all of the like everything that, that somebody like Denzel brings to the mm-hmm. table, he brings to the table. So like why is his name not uh not like, he was in Ray as well. This ain't no weed, Ray. When Ray, they was in the bathroom doing heroin. Yet again, there he is. He's the man. Yeah, he's he's good. Um, I I got uh Michael Imperioli, uh D'Ambrosio on there. Um, he's a he's a great actor. The 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 moment where he's got his intestines hanging out. I've seen enough war films to draw a comparison here that like they really they really nailed the emotional psychological side of war especially in that moment like yeah where (laughs) can you imagine well first of all they they did a really good job of like conveying all right this dude's a fucking mess from the chest down you heard him say i'd do it for you well then it cuts to him over uh over his shoulder shoulder. all i could think is like man you got dirty intestine juice and blood just dripping down your back in this hot sweaty hike so i'm feeling it from like anthony's perspective like how just nasty and your this must be but you have to do it and then from um d'ambrosio's perspective like every step had to feel like, like fucking, fucking death. death. Like, that's why I'm oh like, man, God. just fucking kill me. Like, I can't uh, and go again, home like from this. Anthony's perspective, you're on this hike with this with this brother, your brother in arms Blood brother on your point. shoulder. Blood yeah. Brother. And you just have this, he's like right in his ear, kill me. Mm-hmm. Kill me. And I, and it like a, it's it's funny to me in the sense that like he's just He's just saying it with like almost no emotion because he has nothing left to give. Like, just I do it for you, kill me. But like, it's also the gravity of that is so. It's and almost like you would. I'm not saying it was a direct callback, but you would think that maybe somebody on Tropic Thunder was like, "Man, let's get the guts like they had it in uh, Dead Presidents." It was when they come and they yeah, yeah. It was very reminiscent of that. Crazy man. But uh, Michael Imperioli's his uh. He does a really like you could see the conviction and desperation in his eyes, and he's really great at conveying this in the characters he plays because he did something similar with his character in Sopranos. Uh, he he he's in a very similar situation in the Sopranos where you kind of get to watch him die inside before he dies for real, mm-hmm. and uh, he he's just really good at bringing those moments to life, like those desperate moments of clinging on to life uh he 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 pulled that off perfectly shout out to uh because he gave you he made you hate him at every moment uh, uh T- terrence howard cowboy yeah. you you need somebody like that as much thing that's going on in the world like you just see him uh, hey hey man hey man if he's one of your friends i they, they, without saying i there he sold heroin and how do i know he sold heroin they don't have to say he sold heroin you have skip played by chris tucker sitting in front of the store zoned out his fucking mind and then Terrence Howard Cowboy walks up and looks at uh, uh um um Lorenz Tate when he comes back from the war. He says, Hey man, it's a friend of yours. Since you're a soldier, you know what I'm saying? I'll give you a discount for him. Mm-hmm. Basically saying, like, damn, I you know, I look out for him. He's like, oh shit, young blood. And so again, he's like, I'll get with you in a minute, man. Hey man, go get me some squares, man. I got some business to handle, baby. You know that that they didn't just show him again. So you only see him three times, but in every single time you see him, he makes you hate this motherfucker. Yeah. Hate. Love to hate him. Right. Uh, he was uh, he was my uh, my my last honorable mention because mm-hmm. uh, all the see all the pool table scenes he made kind of like the hot not the highlight of the movie but mm-hmm. they were they were breaks that were extremely welcomed like from all the intense drama mm-hmm. to kind of go into where there's still some serious shit happening but it's serious shit that you can laugh at because Terrence Howard does such a good job at like conveying this shitty character in such a humorous way. I, I, you said it earlier when he's motherfucking got to pull out his little knife on the table but he keeps looking up at Cuddy to see what he's doing. Yeah. Yeah. It, the little things and I also like the fact that this was before like his whole main became a meme. Oh so, yeah. So like hey, he was he was laying it in on every Everybody, single yeah. line. Yeah. <laughs> Mike. Give me some squares, Mike. <laughs> All right. Uh, I, 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 I want, I want a whole collection of Terrence Howard audiobooks. I just want him to read He'll every, every one of my favorite books. He'll do it. He'll do it. So, so who do you have as your scene stealer, sir? My scene. I'm sorry. Sorry. Let me give one of my, one of my honorable mention, please. Um, again, I want to give an honorable mention to the young lady, uh, who I love, and like I said, she's, um, 
Jennifer Lewis, if you guys do not know this, and again, this she is, like I say, the film slash TV mom. She's played mom in so many films and movies that I can't even name, but just one that comes to mind is, is The Temptations, when she, she was Blue's mom. She She's just been a mom in almost every single thing that you can think of, and she's such, she was a mom in, uh, uh, not two can play that game with uh with a uh, Morris Chestnut and, and things of that nature. So she is an excellent, 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 excellent actress who has over forty years in the industry. She's always getting work. She like literally look it up. She literally has four decades of work oh, yeah. under her belt. And I just want to give her an honorable mention because of the fact that again she's never gotten her just due in my opinion. But she can't. She brings it every single time, and she's never stopped being herself. So definitely honorable mention to Miss Jennifer Lawrence. I, I Miss Jennifer Lewis. Jesus Christ, Miss Jennifer Lewis. I mean Jennifer Lawrence is good too. She's not Jennifer Lewis though. Oh, uh, I, I have to agree with you on Jennifer Lewis because while I did not, her character bothered me. It's because that means she, she did, did her such job. a good job yeah, yeah, yeah. playing that role. Yes. So, yes. Uh, and now, guys, we're going to get to our scene stealers. Dave, what you got? Uh, Chris Tucker. Purely because of how surprised I was by him, um, his range. Uh, he's a, he, he, he serves both, both the comedic relief and the dramatic angle of the movie uh, for the most part. Um I would give him the scene stealer solely on his portrayal of being high on heroin down to the little things like, like grabbing his dick when like he, as soon as he shot up, like little, and the way he's staring, like, if you uh, notice he grabbed his dick right before he left uh, the military, it it was little signs then we didn't mm -hmm. know though yet. Go ahead. He, but yeah, he did, he did such a good job at, uh, when, when Anthony stops back by to see him and he's outside the barbershop, I thought like, Oh fuck, is he like shell shocked or like, gone or something he was gone but just mm -hmm. temporarily um and uh also the way he subtly played those because when when you like are conveying ptsd it'd be so easy to take it to the extreme and like where like he he did it low key and remember, it would remember, sean, P more remember sean penn we hold it behind it what movie um, I'm saying from uh, Tropic Thunder, man, he was like, he went too far. Remember oh, oh yeah, said, yeah, yeah. Went home empty handed. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't want to go too far. You don't want to over portray it. So, I, 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 and it made me think after watching him in this movie that I, I think that Friday kind of fucked him. As much as it, as much as it catapulted him into like fame, I think it fucked his career as an actor because while well, as great as he was in that movie, I think it pigeonholed him into that kind of character where if if not for that movie, he could have been on a trajectory like more like someone like Will Smith or Denzel Washington that had equal dramatic and, and comedy going on. Um, I agree. And that last shot of him with the needle in his mm -hmm. arm and the glazed over ghost eyes was uh, that's something to haunt your nightmares. Okay. I, you know what? I'll I, never watch. I'll never see him in Friday the same yeah, after seeing yeah. him in this. No, and I'll tell you this uh, again. Uh, he needs to come back because yeah. uh, he needs to just he needs to just come back and reinvent himself as a as a dramatic actor because he would kill it. Okay. I mean, well, Will Smith can't come to the Grammys anymore, the Oscars anymore. Don't it get was. me started on that. All right. With that being said, <laughs> uh, I, it, was, it wasn't tough for me, but I'll say this. One of the people that I almost put into this category, that's why I saved that as not an honorable mention because he was almost my scene stealer. He just fell, he fell uh, to the same thing that I believe we said uh, when I was trying to remember the argument I had for Candyman and I wanted to give it to someone, but they didn't have enough. Ain't have enough time on screen, and sometimes people are held back by that. But again, Clifton's Clifton Powell's portrayal of Cuddy really, again, like you say, you didn't see it coming. I was just, I was expected the pimp part and all this other stuff, but with him to come back and say to explain to him, like, man, while you was going, I was taking care of him. Mm -hmm. Now, now, because what he was really trying to say, nigga, she could have been out here with some of these other motherfuckers. You know what I'm saying? Now you home on back, and then that's just how things were back then. And it's just to the 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 level of restraint that he showed him, yeah. like, a, and again, and it was just like. To me, the, the the range that he showed and then then the intensity and then he just let you know he's he's like that person that could be your best friend or your worst enemy. You know, he was always tinkering on that just how it was and it's how he looks at him. It looked him in the eye. He said, I, I care about Sarah, I care about Wanda. You believe he what he literally was not there just to fuck her. 
Yeah, no. Yeah, I, that, you know what I'm saying? If so, somebody else would have done that scene, I would have thought, like, yeah, this guy's got ul- ulterior motives. motives. But it, he seemed, he Genuine. did a really good job at being a sincere asshole. Correct. Like, come on. Like, it's it, so, and it, it, thank you. So it, it was close. He just did not have enough time. And to be honest with you, it's truly one of his, uh, in my opinion, is one of his best acting performances ever. Not the best, but one of the best. But I have to agree with you that it is Christopher Tucker. And I couldn't agree with you more when you said that, uh, it was a, it was a, don't get me wrong. If that's going to be the worst thing to happen to me, let, let me get pigeonholed and get all that money. Yeah. But, uh, but point being is, is that I'm, that's why I really want, that was one of the top three, three reasons I wanted you to see this film because there's 90% of America out there that does not know that Chris Tucker can act like that. Mm-hmm. He acted his ass off. And I didn't know when I saw the shit, I'm thinking like, okay, he's going to make me laugh the whole fucking movie. He made you laugh. He'll make you laugh. He'll make you cry. He'll let you live. He'll let you die. And he did. We met him telling jokes and we ended with him with a needle in his fucking arm. Mm -hmm. And think about it. I I don't even think you thought about this aspect. He, out of everybody in the robbery, he didn't need the money. Yeah. He was doing it simply because Anthony was his friend. Yeah. And you could see, like, all throughout the movie, uh, even when he's making you laugh, you could see something Some tragic in his eyes. It, it like, tears that, that, that these Things were not going to turn up well for him. He was like, man, he's like, he's like, he I'm all right. I'm all right, baby. Yeah, I'm a skippy, baby. I'm going like, to be skippy. Yeah, I'm good, baby. And, but as soon as Anthony left, you saw it on his face. He was like, reality's back now. Yeah. Those are the little beats. See, you didn't even know Chris Tucker could do beats. No. He's doing beats. He's making you believe it. And even when he's amped up doing the thing, and like when he knocks Cleon ass out, like mm-hmm. he, cause it, that's, that's that PTSD. That's all that shit happening to him. That hair, and he told him, man, it ain't the hair on, man. Like I know what my high do. It's something going on in me and you felt that shit, man. And so it's like, yeah. damn. Yeah. Can Chris Tucker make a motherfucker feel? And he did. And it's a shame that this movie, put it this way, had he came back and did this after uh, Rush Hour and all that other stuff, then I think the movie would have been got taught and more to be like, starring Chris Tucker, mm-hmm. Loren State. But it didn't get that. It was just like, they all on the come up. Like, oh, it's just, pe- this got discarded in the film industry as just another black film. I'm telling you that. Yeah, and, and it's stand up performances by everybody. I mean, there wasn't a bad performance no, in the movie. It wasn't anybody overacting or in like everybody, even, even the, I think even the people who were trying to overact, they were like, Let's give him less lines, like the dad. Like, mm-hmm. let's want some more call it, son. Like, hey man, just or, chill. Or Terrence Howard is like, you know what? That's actually working. Keep, keep doing that. Keep, <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. So, again, the, the saddest part about this, like you just said, is that most of America does not know that this level of actor exists with inside Chris Tucker, and it's a shame. It's a tragedy. But here at TTFT, we do recognize those talents. So, Chris Tucker, get your making me laugh, cry, and all those emotions in between on this TTFT board hall of fame. Scene stiller, Mr. Christopher. Tucker. You just got put the fuck up on the board. All right. Money, 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 money. Money. He is a writer, a director, a visual artist, an Emmy Award winning actor on the stage, in the movies, and on TV, appearing in films and shows such as Get Smart, NYPD Blue, ER, 24, Malcolm in the Middle, Prison Break, Modern Family, Dead Presidents, and more. He has a license to fly and a black belt to fight, and we sincerely hope that we do not persuade him to use either of those two skills during the course of this conversation. Thank you very much to Monty Sharp for being with us today. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Money, 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 money. Money. Now, in 1995, you make your big screen debut with The Reason Why You're Here, of course, Dead Presidents. You waiting on the number 11 bus? Um, now, we read that the production began around Halloween, if I'm not mistaken, of 94 and actually wrapped up in February of 95. Um, if you can recall, how long were you on set for? I was on set for, I think, maybe maybe three or four days. Mm-hmm. I got hired for a one day stint and then uh, they changed the role. Mm-hmm. So they said, uh, we don't really know what we're going to do, but we know you're going to be a cop. OK, So just show up. So I was like, okay. And again, a feather, le- and a feather le- leather neck. <laughs> and a feather leather neck. That's- <laughs> so, uh, you know, I showed up and like I said, I, I was, I'm, I'm always kind of like, you know, I, you know, improvisational, whatever, whatever you want to do, let's just figure it out. And so uh, actually I was supposed to go to Mexico with my mom for a soap event. I was going to take my mom to this event in Mexico and we were supposed to leave the next day. So, uh, we shot a little bit with the police officer. And then at the end of the day, the producer said, hey, they want you to come back. They want to do a little more. And you come back tomorrow. I said, man, I got to go. You know, I'm going to got to go to Mexico to do this thing. And I'm taking my mom and she's look, looking forward to it. And he said, do you want it or not? 
And I said, oh, man, you know, so I call my mom. I apologize. I'm like, look, you know, this happened. She was like, go, you know, do your work, you know, whatever. And uh, so we we literally kind of made that roll up. I mean, that whole scene with, um, uh, I think okay. it was a boat, a wood yeah. Oh, yes. That was totally improv. I mean, we just, you know, that whole thing was just, I was just riffing and they would. It felt natural. It did feel natural. I'll put both of it. No, brother, I, I think you're mistaken about that bus. <laughs> I it, caught it yesterday. <laughs> it felt natural, but it yeah. built so seamlessly yeah. into the tension of the scene and, and setting things off so so subtly. He's talking about they were improv. He pulled that big ass map out of his back. Like, no, brother, right here. I got it right here. Don't you worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> so if if they weren't quite sure what they were going to do with with you as far as what character you're going to play, what was the audition process like as far as getting a role? It was with Alan and Albert, and it was for a uh, a role that didn't actually make it to the film. It's like a, I think it was like a crazy homeless guy or something like that. It was like two or three lines, mm. and I went in and you know I did my thing and. I remember they laughed. Oh man, they laughed. You know, they were like, "That's it. That's it." You know, that's the guy. You know, and so we were. You know, it was a good, good time. And when I left there, I thought, "Man, I, you know, I booked that. I know I booked that." And then uh, I learned that they weren't going to do that role. My agent called and said, "They're not going to do that role." So they're going to, they're going to come up with something. We just don't know what it is yet. So I that's said, "Okay, that's cool." And eventually, they said, "You're going to be a cop. We don't know what you're going to do, but you're going to be a cop." And, and one of the only black cops that we saw in the film, might I add, I mean, it's just, hey, you, you were there, man. So you were, you were uh, uh, when I was watching the scene, it was it was real. What was really cool to me about it is, was it seemed like you were privy to what was going on or at least had some kind of hunch that something wasn't right. And you were kind of like cat and mousing Bo Keem in that moment. Like, no, I'll, I'll check. I ca-. Like almost like calling a bluff. Was that yeah. how you were playing it? Since like, since it was improv, I feel like I could ask you what your, what your motivation was in that moment. Like, how, did you know the context of what was happening within that scene around it and everything and how you would play into it? My, yeah, my approach to it was it, it was a very deserted scene. We were out in Brooklyn and there was really nothing on the street. It was just kind of deserted. I mean, there was this guy just kind of standing at the bus stop, kind of sticking out like a sore thumb. There's nothing going on on my beat, but here's this guy, you know. But I was just kind of like my approach to it was like, I don't want to telegraph. I don't want to, you know, obviously I don't know what's going to happen, but what are you doing on my block? Mm-hmm. Like, what's up with you, man? You know, let's see if it, you'll see if you check out. I'll check it out. You know, brown on patrol, blah blah blah. That was yeah. kind of my to it, yeah. I like that. That was Dell Slick. You know, well, you you wanted to know if it was uh, Skippy that that uh, he blew it. He, he was around there looking all nervous, smoking cover. cigarettes and shit. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? But uh, I t- it reminded me. He, I, you should know what I'm talking about. It reminded me of when Queen Latifah used to be throwing those uh, uh, uh cassettes out the car, and that's how they found them just by just doing little stuff like that. I was saying mm-hmm. how he flicked all the cigarettes on the ground from standing there. But uh, yeah. um, I was going to ask you're one of the few people that have actually got an opportunity to do what I call like three levels of acting, where you can go from the stage, you can do the theater and the big screen. So let me ask you this: being this your first feature film, what was was it like adapting to that kind of environment versus the theater or television? It, it was kind of tough, you know, because there's a lot of things happening on a movie set and mm. you don't always know where the focal point is. Mm. Uh, whereas in theater, of course, you always know where the focal point is. It's with the director. He's right in front of you usually. And then when he's not there and you're in performance, it's with the audience. They're right there. Uh, soap opera is a little bit similar in that we shoot in sort of a flat sort of a you know, it's three cameras and they're right in front of you. Mm-hmm. So there's one there, one there, one there. So you kind of know what's going on. When I got on the film set, there's so much activity, so many people doing so many different things. And the director isn't readily apparent. You don't really know where they are. They got right. video videos over there, but you don't really know whether they're in there or not sometimes. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of hard to know what to focus on. Mm-hmm. You know, where do I, who do I sometimes, you know, I remember even showing up and nobody shows, hey, Monty, you know, welcome, come on over here. This is what you do. And you go over here and you just show up and it's like, what do I do? You know, there's a name on a trailer. Okay. So I just go in there and hang out. And eventually somebody will come and say, we need you, you know, come over here and get into makeup or, you know, I'm going to see in wardrobe or something like that. So that was a little, I was a little insecure about that. At the time, I thought it was, I used to have this thing, man, where on every job, I always thought I was going to get fired. Hmm. I always thought, fuck, you know, they're going to hate this and they're going to fire me. And 
nobody's talking to me and nobody showed up to say anything to me. It's because there's somewhere going like, to get rid of that guy. You know, how do we get rid? I had that kind of uh, impo- like imposter syndrome. Exactly. Somebody yeah. was going to be somebody was on to me at some point. I thought. Where do you think that came from? I think it's probably natural for actors. You know, we sometimes, you know, especially in film, you don't really get that immediacy in terms of feedback, whether it be from an audience or whether it be from your director or something like that. So you sometimes that can feel kind of weird. You do something, you put something out there and then there's just silence. You're kind of like, well, was that good or but, was that bad? Or But you're not you just know? Monty Sharp. You're Emmy award winning Monty Sharp at this point. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. uh, that's crazy that the imposter syndrome, like, uh, do, do you still feel that today? There's a little bit of that, you know, there's always a bit of that because you're always, um, you know, you're always trying something. There's a, mm-hmm. always a bit of actor's invention. So you try something. Sometimes it might be just, just a small thing. Sometimes it might be a big thing, but you don't always get that immediate feedback about whether or not that worked or didn't work. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and that can often make you, I heard a story about Robert De Niro, even today that he's a, uh, someone said he's an extremely insecure actor on set. He's constantly asking the crew, you know, was that good? Did you like that? Or, you know, that work or not? Maybe it's not insecurity. Maybe it's just feedback. So you can self correct. Mm-hmm. You know, you need that feedback. So you real can, time. Yeah. That's one thing about that Broadway. You'll know right away whether they're feeling you or not. <laughs> Instantly, you're going to get it right away. Um, right. Now, the, clearly the directors, uh, you really must have won them over because, again, like you say, usually when a role hits the cutting room floor, so does the actor. But clearly they created a role for you in such a role that you're in such a substantial scene in the film. This is very pivotal. You yeah. actually are working, as you mentioned, with Bokeem Woodbine, not to yeah. mention Chris Tucker is on set. So let me ask you this here. Now, you literally go from not knowing what your role is, role being cut, and now you're thrust into this situation. Could you explain what it's like when you guys are in that scene and what was it like to work with those actors and just really be thrust into that? Uh, it's it's a little difficult because those guys had already been working together for, you know, many weeks. So they, mm-hmm. they've already gelled. They're, they're sort of, you know, familiar with one another. They're horsing around. They've got their routine going. And then someone shows up who's not a part of that reindeer game. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So there's a kind of, hey, who is this guy? Or, you know, you know, maybe we like him. Maybe we don't. You know, that kind of thing. Is he going to be an asshole? You know, mm-hmm. you don't really know. So my approach has always been the work. Look, mm-hmm. whether I'm an asshole or not, whether you're an asshole or not, I came here to do a job and I'm ready to do my job. I recall there's a moment in there where I pull my gun out and I start trotting over across the street. Mm-hmm. Well, there was a cameraman with a uh, with a steady cam and he's got an assistant who's sort of guarding his back as he walks backwards and I'm mm-hmm. walking toward him. And the first take on that, I started out too fast. And he said, you know, he, he like went off on me, you know, like, what are you what are you doing? You know, you fucking idiot or whatever. Side or the other. And I said, you know, I didn't really know very much. I, I, I'm a human being, you know. I, right. I said, hey, man, you don't fucking talk to me like that. You know, mm-hmm. you, you, I can make any correction you need to make. I said it was a mistake, but you don't fucking talk to me. What the fuck is your problem? You know, like that. Mm-hmm. And I just thought as a human being, you just don't speak to people like that. Correct. I mean, the way I understand what happened. We can make it better. But right. what are you doing? Right. And I think at that moment, it kind of it kind of loosened everybody else up. They were kind of right. like, oh, OK, you know, this dude is like, you know, real deal or whatever. And so I got a little bit of respect out of that. Right. And we were, you know, a lot looser at that point. So. Right. I bet take two went a lot better. Yeah. Hey, could you just let them know? Just pacing's good. Like, like, like you, you, you got to set the tone. Like you said, it wasn't even an acting thing. It was a a human being thing. Human Whether being. I'm fixing your fries or making your bed, just we can fix it. Just don't uh, talk to me uh, like that. I don't know what kind That's of day you're happy. having, but you're not going to work your temper out on me. Right. Okay. Yeah. Watch how fast I walk up to you. If I was going too fast before. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. In uniform. Too. Yeah. <laughs> um, you get to partake uh, in a shootout during your scene. And I was wondering what that was like, especially like right, right now with gun safety on set being such a hot button topic. Um, there's like guns ablazing in your scene all throughout you. And like, what what is it like when you're walking? And I'm, I'm sure some of it's added in in post, but um, but you're like you're you're like walking and and seriously like walking in faith that everything goes right, that everybody did their job correctly. 
Was yeah. that was that on your mind at all? Uh, for most of the scene, no. I, I trusted everyone. The weapons master makes it clear. You know, everybody has to clear the weapons. So you look, you can see, you feel confident that everything's taken care of. You don't actually get to handle the actual picture weapon until picture's up. Mm. Rehearsals are with a dummy gun, so there's no real danger there. And um, in this particular case, I didn't really feel a little nervous until the squib hit on the head. So they had a squib in the hat, and I knew that that was going to go off, and I'd never taken a squib hit before. So I didn't really know what that was going to be like. And uh, that made me feel a little, okay, they're about to put basically a small firecracker in my hat. And uh, if it doesn't go well, you know. Maybe it. (laughs) So the only thing that went off on set that day was the camera guy. There you go. (laughs) (laughs) And then actually we'll we'll, we'll get into the uh, the logistics of the – of getting shot in the head because that was a it was a great shot. Yeah, I was gonna. I, was, I mean, spoiler alert: you definitely do get shot here. I was gonna say, and, and not just by anybody. You get shot. I mean, you get shot by Smokey and not the bear, yeah, of course. The <laughs> yeah, there you go. Are you got, okay? Clearly, uh, Chris Tucker here puts a bullet in the back of your head, and yeah. you see your facial expression. That beat is to me very golden in that moment, and and the X wound, like you said, what you call it, a swib. Squib. Uh, squib. 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 Yeah. Yes, it gets it comes out. It's pretty good. It's a, it's a very gruesome death scene. Let's just say that. Can you tell us about the logistics of that? Like you were saying, did somebody come over and like, hey, don't worry, it's going to go off. Just let us do our thing. Or was it like, like you said, this could really kind of ruin me if I don't know what's going on here. What was your mindset? Because you're not only acting no more. Now you're an action star. And what yeah. did it feel like when it went yeah. off? <laughs> um, it was quite a little pop. And, okay. you, know, <laughs> you know, you feel it and you hear it. It's literally like a firecracker. Did they do it more than one scene or is it just one, one time, one go? No, this particular thing was one take, man. I remember um, Alan and Albert, and it's pretty serious. You know, they're like, listen, you know, here's what's going to happen. We're going to put this explosive in your hat. There's a tube that's running over your head and then down your back. In fact, in that scene, if you look closely, when Chris Tucker steps in, his gun enters frame, you can see the tube in the back of my uniform. You can kind of see it kind of the impression of it, if you look for it. I'm going to go back and look But they it. said, listen, you know, this is going to be loud. Um, it's not going to hurt, but you're going to feel it. And uh, we have one take. We have to get this, you know. So there was that, and then there was the pressure of the one take. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so when it went off, I think I'm shooting the gun or whatever, and then when it goes off, it kind of was, it got my attention, you know. And I, in that same second, I thought, well, fuck, you can't blow this because it's one take. And so I, it was like a paralyzed kind of a moment where I thought, and then I thought, die, dude, die. Yeah. <laughs> it was so bad. You're like, oh, oh. Yeah. <laughs> You'll never take me alive. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, a, it was quite, a, uh, quite a shock. Oh yeah, uh, that's, that's crazy that you get one take to do the, to have the reaction, and you don't really fully know what to expect. Like it, it worked out, but I could see how like someone like me, I would have been ah ah, like, that's loud. Was it supposed to be that loud? Cut, <laughs> cut. Like I, I would have. Um, uh, you would think they would have done like a a rehearsal with it to so you can anticipate how how it was going to feel that's that's crazy you, know, you want to give people as less time as possible to let them know you're putting an explosive in their head yeah we're putting an explosive in so your right, head. I, I, girls, we're going in three two <laughs> and like go go so yeah that's yeah. um they did say i remember the night of the premiere we went to the premiere screening and uh i think it was alan hughes who said uh he pulled me aside and he said look man he's like i just want you to know your your death scene is the most expensive single shot in the movie and I said, why? I said, what, really? He said, yeah, because some of the blood jumped onto the camera lens. So they had a big old spot of blood on there and they had to remove it digitally at a time when digital wasn't ubiquitous. It wasn't sort of a normal thing. It was a very expensive uh, correction to that shot that they had to make. Wow. The that's SLRs that's running cool. around back then. So there's a... Yeah, well, why? Well, why they were in there? Why didn't they digitally remove the the tube? And you're <laughs> <laughs> a little bit more money. There you go. Um, what were the Hughes brothers like to work with? They were a lot of fun, man. They they seemed to just be on cloud nine. I mean, they were having a great time, and the audition was just a lot of fun. They were laughing and getting into it and feeding off of each other. And uh, when I got to set, they had these uh, 
scooters. You know, they were riding around on these scooters and they were just playing and, you know, zipping up and down the street while all the other departments are doing their stuff. And uh, honestly, they didn't really look or behave like directors. They just looked like a couple of dudes who happened to be on set just goofing off. I mean, that's really what they seem to be. But I also know that they're very, you know, heavily prepared. They storyboard, you know, very specifically. The storyboards are almost exactly what the shots turn out to be. Um, And so I guess that preparation, you know, later I would learn that that kind of preparation will allow you to, once you get to the set, it's just execution. And you've got people that are doing the things that need to be executed. You can chill out. You can relax. Mm, You can have fun. You know, I think that's important too to keep your head clear. So if a problem or curveball does arrive, you're more in, arise, yeah, yeah, you're more in the headspace. Yeah, the uh, the, what kind of direction? Do you remember what kind of direction you got? So it's just very interesting to me at the scene that such a pivotal scene was improvisational. But did they give you any like beats to hit or like the the uh, direction as far as the context of where you're coming from and where it's going from there to? Or, or like how much time they wanted you to get in and out of the the uh, exchange? Not really, man. I think my my sense in retrospect is I don't think they knew exactly what they wanted when they when when I show you know when I hit the set. But whatever it was that I was doing for them, it was working. Mm-hmm. And so it was more a question of oh now let's get a shot of his feet, and then oh let's get this shot. And then let's get this shot. Oh, this would be cool. Can you come back on Monday? Cause we want to do this, that, the other. Da, da, da. So I never got anything like, okay, you know, make it more this way or make it less this way. In fact, I was, no one even said any lines really. I didn't have a, you know, you get the little sides or whatever. I think I might, they might've scripted like maybe one line or something like that. But I just, you know, was just talking. I was just in the moment and trying to be real in my character. And I made up some lines, not really thinking that necessarily they're going to use that. But that was just for me. That was my process of, you know, doing my work. And they wound up, you know, keeping that, you know. That was really good. It was very natural, unfortunately. Now, now, before we move on from Dead Presidents, um, is there anything you think the uh, fans of the film will want to know about your experience that you can tell them, whether it was in front of the camera, behind the camera, or just something that they may not know? Well, you know, one of uh, there's something that happened when I rapped on that shoot that I don't know what are we talking twenty years ago, whatever mm-hmm. thirty years ago. It still you know haunts me to, <laughs> to this day. Okay. And I was, as I said, I was supposed to go to Mexico and I was going to go pick up my mom and this and that. And so when I rapped for that day, I was making a beeline to get out of there because I needed to go make some calls and this and that. And I got about halfway down the street toward the trailers and Chris Tucker came around the corner and he said, hey, man. And I turned around. He said, we should hang out. And I turned back and I said, uh, OK, man, let's let's hook up. And I went on into my trailer and then, you know, because we had call sheets, I figured we could get. But what I didn't, he probably meant like, let's hang out like right now. Let's go get a drink or let's go do whatever. And then so I got swept up in the whole Mexico thing and I had to go and then come back and this and that. And I never called Chris Tucker and we never really talked again. And I thought, well, that's a huge missed opportunity, right? <laughs> you know, right there. Hey, man. Uh, We're supposed to be talking, yeah. man. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that, that is that, crazy. That would have been a, been a, a very, <laughs> you don't you don't hold anything against your mom still be for, for <laughs> that, over that, do you? <laughs> So it comes up at family dinner. Every day. That's great. Yeah, that, 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 that is crazy, man. Yeah, one for the, you know. One for the ages. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, before we say goodbye, are there any parting words to the audience you would like to say? It can be a quote. It could be a song. It could just be any words that you're, that's on your mind. You want to put positivity in the world. Anything you want to say? Well, I would like to say, uh, um, you know, look, there's a lot of crazy shit going on out there in the world. but. As you look out there and all that negative stuff, war, famine, people going crazy, in the words of Fred Rogers, look for the helpers. Don't focus on the negative stuff. Look for the people who are trying to help. That's my message. 
beautiful sentiment, sir. I freaking love it, man. I loved you in the film. Um, I, I, I love the work that you're doing now. Hopefully, we can have you back on in the future with your future projects and endeavors. Or you could just shoot us a link to where we can find those paintings at, man, because that is definitely dope. And we'll be able to put it on the, when, your, when your interview comes on. Yeah, that's sure. awesome, man. I really appreciate you guys, um, you know, reaching out. I had a great time and I love what you guys are doing. So anytime, uh, count me in on whatever you guys are are, are doing. If right, I we're going to hold you to that now. We're going to hold you to that. And remember, hey, remember, when you're with us, watch your pace. Don't look up in front of the camera, man. <laughs> hey, man, we enjoyed the interview. Thank you so much. Please enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you so much, sir. You're Thanks. welcome, guys. Okay. Thanks, Talk Martin. To you Have a good night. Bye-bye. All right, guys, it's time for Fucks Giving. In over three seasons, we've given a lot of fucks. So much fuck, Viagra is starting to sponsor us. Thanks, Vi. And with that being said, this is a part of the show where we tell you what we would have changed and how much we really fuck with the film. So five being the best, meaning we really fuck with it. One flying fuck means they shouldn't even let the cameras roll. So, Dave, what are some of the things you would have changed? Let me guess, the end. The ending is on there. I have a few ticky tacky things that happened before the ending. Um, not a fan of long opening credits where nothing is really happening. And uh, these were nearly four minutes. And it was just, I, I, like I said, I love the music. I love the opening theme, but I didn't need four minutes of it. The, uh, the, the burning money was cool shots. I could have used like 90 seconds of that in and out, especially when you have like as much as you had to cover. And this will kind of play into my my feelings about the ending. Like if you want to take four minutes on credits in the beginning with nothing happening, take three minutes off of those credits and spend more and, and put those three minutes at the end. So it doesn't feel as rushed kind of like wrapping up everybody's the stories. Scene, this, that, and the other. Yeah, I got you. yeah. The ending felt weirdly paced in comparison to the rest of the movie. Like the rest of the movie is this real nice slow burn. And then the last five minutes they were like, Oh shit, we need to go, put go, a bow go, on go. everything. And it just, it, it was, it didn't ruin it for me at all. But it did kind of felt rushed in comparison to the rest of the movie. Like I would have been all right with them extending the movie by 20 minutes and watching like a two hour and 20 minute, two hour and 30 minute movie that let the ending flesh out as well as the beginning set up the pieces uh, for like a proper third act. Uh, beyond that, uh, the like I said, the, the lighting and the uh, grad party scene, uh, the, the red just felt a little too blown out for me. But that's just an artistic choice. So it's not like... That, that uh, there's nothing that I really say about that. Like you made a choice, I it just didn't agree with the, the the palette that my eyes are accustomed to. And you know, I'm not a fan of cross dissolves. I'm also not a fan of fade ins and fade outs. No. I feel like it's like it's kind of like when a song just fades out. It's like the musicians didn't know how to end it, so they just play the chorus three more times and and fade it out. And they, they did a lot of fade outs in this, and like the scene where uh, uh, Skip is found dead. They do that the slow fade before it fades into the next scene. It's like, it, and that's just a personal preference for me too, where I just I feel like things are more impactful when it's like, boom, next scene. Like I, I'm a fan of hard cuts. I hate cross dissolves. I hate fade ins, fade outs, and they, they this movie was littered with them. Again, just another personal preference of mine. So, so yeah, the the opening credits shorten them, fix the lighting on the grad scene do some more hard cuts instead of fade outs and, and cross dissolves uh, and, um, and stretch the ending out by about 15 to 20 minutes to really let those scenes breathe and, and conjure the emotion and gravity that the, the beginning of the movie set up. Those were the things that I would change. And none of them, none of them ruined the movie for me at all. Uh, the ending didn't even take away from the rest of the movie because like I got what they were going for in all the scenes. And a part of me, when I was watching it at three o'clock in the morning, appreciated that they were getting the fuck out of there. <laughs> like, but um, from a from a screenwriting standpoint, I feel like there was probably more on the page than somewhere between writing and shooting and cutting. I, I feel like a little bit of uh, character closure got um, r rushed or cut that that should have been there. Okay, that, those are all fair points. Uh... I don't think I, I can see why some people may think the uh, beginning was uh, a little drawn out. I don't think that because of the fact that I think it's mm. letting you know. 
I don't think the beginning was drawn out. No, I'm talking about the credits, opening credits. Oh, okay. Yeah, gotcha. because again, I yeah, think that, that was drawn out. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. I, I don't, I don't agree. It's drawn out. Well, okay, I, it is longer than most, but I think the, uh, what they were going for is they're letting you know this is going to be a slow burn. Notice that the money is burning slowly. That's and a good it, point. And, and I think what they're trying to do, as I was telling you before, is like what they're doing is they're letting you know. Oh my God, they're they're hitting you with the shock factor. Oh my gosh, they are desecrating money. Yeah. And like it has to hit you what well, they are doing. And in their defense, you have to kind of like take it through the uh, the lens of when it came out. Mm -hmm. This was like oh, most movies were doing long opening credit sequences mm -hmm. because two things. People don't stick around for the end credits. True. And we didn't have IMDb or Google back then to like if you wanted to know who made this movie that you loved, mm -hmm. uh, you can go look it up on your phone while it's playing like. Back in the 90s, you had to like, True. for people to get the credit, it had to play in the beginning. And I, I think also where they went for, like, if nobody knows who the Hughes brothers is, and somebody's like, who is the Hughes brothers? You know, the, 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 the people who made the movie with all the money. Burning I didn't know John Hughes had a brother. There you go. Yeah. So so that 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 in itself, um, I agree with you on, well, I will say this, is the, for, for my brother Julian Wilson here, of course, he's going to say that he, what he would have changed, because this is one of his favorite films of all time, is that Cuddy had to die. Cuddy must die. Cuddy must die. Cuddy must die. Anthony was supposed to go back and kill Cuddy, so that's for you, Julian. But so what, you wanted some character closure. And, he and wanted. That. He wanted. No, 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 just his character closed. Him gone. Out yeah. of bye. You know what I'm saying? But with that being said, uh, the only thing that I probably would have changed, ironically, would have been the end. And the reason why I said that I do believe that the end was rushed because here's the thing: either give, either end it. End it when when they catch Anthony and a Kurt, Kirby. End it there some type of way. Like they they go out or even end it with all those guns drawn down him. Maybe we don't see every, all those officers coming in focus. We just see their guns rushing in up him. And like you just said, it's just like you just see his eye and it just goes in the black and it ends there. Mm -hmm. Or hell, even end it in the court scene. You brought Martin Sheen in, fucking use him. Okay. So yeah. I didn't need to see him on that bus going to, I know he's going to prison. Yeah. That chair throw should have, you know what I'm saying? That like, like, even if you would have just show, let, let's say we don't even know if Martin Sheen it moves, you just keep the camera on him throwing the chair at the camera and it just hits it and it goes black. Like, mm -hmm. God. Oh, damn. yeah, that would have been powerful. Yeah. Like, I, fought, I, I, I fought for this fucking country. You're going to send me to life. Boom. Boom. Bam. And that and shit's that's going that's the fucking that, 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 that's that's the There fucking you go. Yeah. So that's one time where I agree with you that the ending should have been, like you said, they they had probably already secured the rights for the bus. And sometimes it's just too much. And I mm -hmm. also think they were really trying to make that two hour runtime for a minute. Like, they almost made it. So I think they kept, like, we got to get this, but got to get that and to be honest with you the only thing they could have took was what you just said uh, i feel like they were trying to keep it under two hours oh, okay probably so. but they probably had they probably had like two hours and 10 two hours and 15 and minutes cut, cut worth here, and they're like, here, cut, they're like here, cut, this okay. is a film with a bunch of people that nobody knows from a from black filmmakers right. like we're already going to be working against the odds on this thing we we can't also have a two hour and 20 minute run i can time. see that so they start cutting and you can tell that most of that stuff they cut was from the end mm -hmm. it felt rushed the pacing was beautiful throughout the whole film but at the end it was just like all right we got to get there we got to get you don't have to get there somebody yeah. has to stand up and say no it's ruining the pacing but like you say None of these things detract from this being a great film. Mm -mm. We're nitpicking. So for me, that's the only thing that I would have changed there. Um, and it's, it's almost like you say, I will agree, I guess, with you. I don't hate crossfades, but I will say this. In certain scenes where people are dead and things happen, there shouldn't be a crossfade because of the fact that I now cannot isolate them see these scenes on their own. I'm taking the emotion of this scene all the way into the next one. Yeah. You, it doesn't give you a chance to visually get to something else. Yeah. So so I agree with you on that. But that's well, the only well, thing I would have changed. I, I like uh, the perfect use of the hard cut is the fair, fair when he Ferris Bueller's into Vietnam. Oh, perfect. So that, you know how to do it. And that perfectly conveyed the emotion of like, when you're going into war, which I've never went into war, but I can only imagine there's no possible way to prepare yourself for that situation. Like even if you, even if he, it showed him go through boot camp right. and all like, like saying goodbye to family and getting on the yeah. plane and, and stepping foot on the ground in the war zone for the first time, like none of that preparation could prepare you for the battle correct so the way they cut straight from him like you're in the shit right like, there's no way to emotionally prepare yourself for that that was a good use and it of went on cut. with the theme of it, they, they couldn't prepare white america for or suburban america any type of america for this film they just 
they drop you into it. Mm -hmm. They don't give you, and I'm happy they didn't show him saying goodbye to mom and him coming back home and them to get him. You got picked up in the cab to, uh, and then you go. So that's all that I would change there. But uh, so, so let me ask you this. With that being said, guys, what would you change? What are some things that you would want to see? And please put it in the comments below or in the live chat. And don't forget to hit that super, super chat. Drop some coins to TTFT. Money, 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 money. Money. All right. So uh, they did a great job at conveying the reality of war from an emotional standpoint. Things you don't usually consider in the grand cinematic way that war is usually conveyed in movies. Uh, like most, like I think that I think it worked to their advantage in this one that they had to go small scale with the war scenes because that forced them to get into the like the 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 human factor of mm -hmm. it and the emotion of it rather than the big explosions mm -hmm. and the tropic thunder opening sequence and it's not all bombs and explosions it's what's happening on what's happening to these people on the inside um it's the true story yeah like, but it doesn't it, lack any military thing now because when they get in the shit you feel oh, like you're yeah, in the shit yeah yeah they, they I mean, yeah they definitely play both angles of it well but like just even specifically the part where um anthony has to uh kill michael imperioli with the second morphine shot like you could see in that moment, um, he's obviously killed people there before, but that is where it took a turn for him on the inside and where like the callous began to creep in because you can't go back from like, even though it was a mercy killing, he killed an innocent, he killed somebody that he was supposed to protect. It was like a different to him that kind of broke him a little bit inside and they, they showed that so well. Is that what he said? Oh, it's better to go home. It's better yeah, to check yeah. out. In that, where, yeah, when he gives Ambrosio that, that morphine shot. It's better to check out than go home all fucked up. And that is like, encapsulates the whole premise of the movie right there like that could be the tagline for the movie. It's better to check out than to go home all fucked up. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and it's also in that moment that it's another foreshadowing moment where you know when he says that, you know that this isn't going to end well for any of them. Right. Because he's pretty much telling you right there, like, you might as well just die now because it ain't getting, it's all downhill from here. I also liked how the movie, it felt like, like the beginning of it, it was like paid in full meets rounders. And then for the the middle hat, the middle so chunk of it, meets full metal jacket, a mm -hmm. little bit of Forrest Gump mm -hmm. in there. Mm -hmm. um, and then like when they're planning the heist and getting every, like getting the gang together. Ocean Elevens. Dawn in 60 it's seconds. Mm -hmm. You know, that especially in the church scene when it does that classic cut where it's like, how much money was it? How much money did you say was in that truck? Cut two, mm -hmm. he's already in it now. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and they did, and they transitioned between those like genres of crime drama seamlessly, which is a feat in itself. Um, great storytelling, utilizing the backdrop of the war on top of trying to survive in America in the 60s as black men. But there's the Joker in the street. Here you go, brother. Don't let the bullshit get to you. <laughs> I'm trying, man. I'm trying. Uh, how they took their time with the character development and slowly stacked the cards against them so their transformations were believable and the lengths they went to in order uh, to survive felt natural. It comes together to tell an infuriating tragedy, the, the demise of someone who at the beginning you see all this promise in and you just watch them get deteriorated and chipped away at by the system, by society, by even their family, by people that they're supposed to be leaning on. Um, it just kind of like you can tell his brother completely disowned him. You know, like his brother, he's nothing. Yeah, like, and that's what I that's what I took away from the movie most of all is that uh, how fucked up the system is. How it will like even if you literally, as they say, give your all, mm -hmm. uh, you still come back and get spit out. It's two ways to do it. You you can do it like they did it beautifully. Well, There's three ways to do it. The wrong way, which is just to throw it in your face. The right way to do it creatively. Uh, the other way to do it creatively is should I say is how they did it in the Joker. Where he was like, they, they they cut off my medicine. You know, he's making yeah. fun of it, but he's being serious. Or you could do it the way the Hughes brothers did it. They don't directly say what happened. They're, they're just in passing telling you in the story. He's like, man, how, man, how you get over with 50% medical? You, man, I'm getting over like a fat rack. I got my VA check coming, this check coming. And, and like you say, it's the... The, the the jackets they wear, they show you like that's how they knew he was a vet. I noticed that little reconnaissance pack. I mean that uh, recon. So those things for me but, again. Well, well, but to to the storytelling was so powerful that they were able to give us the main character, show the main character strangle his girlfriend, um, consider mm -hmm. abandoning his daughter, mm -hmm. uh, 
shoot a, a, a security guard in the face and beat another security guard in the head to death with the butt of a gun. Mm-hmm. And you still care for them. And, and uh, yeah, and I, I yeah. So the, like they, they did such a good job at that slow burn character development and getting to know this character that's like, I can see, yeah, you push this man to the fucking brink. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. I he's understand. Uh, he slowly do, broke. Do, though I, does it justify what he's doing? It, no. it, does it make it right? No, but do I understand? Yeah, and I still feel bad for him. And, it, and yeah. Yeah. But they make you feel, and I'm, I'm being funny here, but it's, uh, I, I still say it's still his fault why that fucking robber got botched because I, I, I beg to say that that guy that was in that security guard van thing, he saw that brown jacket. That's how I knew they were. We're being ambushed. <laughs> Shit, butterscotch over here is coming from the bottom. Okay, so with that being said, uh, for me, uh, just the dead presence, dead presence is exactly is exactly what it is. It's a double entendre meaning. It's first off, again, the the, the it, first off, of course, all the presidents on the dollar bills are dead. But if you really think about it, all these people that are dead, made some of the rules that are in place now that they had to go through and the things that they were. You know, going after or whatnot, and then the, all the and they tell you, and that's what it made it feels like. Uh, well, you haven't seen Goodfellas, but the Latanza heist and things of that nature. They're saying, wait a minute, they finna take all this money and just finna burn it, and we got people out here start. Like I used to say shit like that as a child. Like, wait a minute, why don't this money's out of circulation? Looks good, yeah. to me. show look good to me. Like, like you can't fathom some of the shit that happens, you know, and. And to me, they yeah, did. It was like office space. Like we're not actually stealing anything. anything. That's, yeah, that's not it. just that they're gonna miss. They're gonna. You know that little it. thing they put pennies in. It's not. It's like taking a percentage of that. And so, and when you look at those things, man, it just it shows you. I don't know, man. It was. I I actually do know. I I don't know. It's not the right word. I do know what they did is again. When I rewatched it again, um, I've seen this movie probably. <laughs> 60, 70 times, and that's not an exaggeration, but on this last rewatch, I really paid attention to the, the things they, 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 like you just said, they took you through so many errors in under two hours. You yeah. literally were in Vietnam, the hood, pool halls, church, like, and, and again, if you notice, again, they, they took you into an area that most people didn't even know exists. They didn't take you to the hood hood. They took you to middle class black America. You didn't really, you didn't see nobody really getting shot, nobody getting oh, robbed or yeah, anything. But, but the white people are moving. Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. there you go. But the, the, not only like the change in atmosphere and scenery and genre, but the characters that you mm-hmm. meet at the beginning of the movie are not are the characters at the end. Characters. Well, Joe's still the same. Joe yeah, was fucked up before you left. And Kirby's pretty consistent. Yeah, yeah, Kirby's and Cowboy. Dig this motherfucker right here, man. Look at you, man. That's a Mackin outfit. If I've ever seen one, look with all the stripes and shit. What, you a captain now? Yeah. yeah. Cowboy, yeah. Cowboy the, didn't change a fucking look. <laughs> nah, he did not. But again, the, the <laughs> other... Ca- oh, and no, no, I take it back. But the people that went to war... war and yeah. came back were all changed. Mm-hmm. Hell, I would have... You know what I'm saying? And, and that's why you say you get a little Forrest Gump feel. Dugan was like... uh, Dugan was like Lieutenant Dan. He's like, all my people died on the field. I want to die on the field. Like, like it gave you all of that. Like, God. And you're right when you hit it on Forrest Gump. When I was over at Vietnam and they ripped all the shit so he couldn't finish talking to tell what really happened. Uh-huh. Hell, so... And like I say, and again... Again, it, it really shows that. So, like I say, guys, um, I'm sorry I messed up y'all's Black Panther, Panther party. <laughs> there you go. You know, but it also showed you stuff that you didn't know. You would think that most people think that every black person in the world loved the Black Panthers when about the revolution. You heard what Kirby said? Oh no, nah, I want one of the motherfucking revolutionary brothers come up in this motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, it's, people, the the it doesn't matter what color you are. The you are not like you're you're not excused from the system. Um, embedding its uh, flaws into you, I guess. Yeah, like and, and becoming indoctrinated. Like, mm-hmm. uh, so I think there's always been pushback against revolution, no matter who, who it's coming from or mm-hmm. where the pushback is coming. There, okay. people will always push back. Okay. But, well, that being said, guys, it's now time to tell you how many fucks we give it. I'm just gonna go ahead and let you know. I give this film five fucks. The reason why I give the film five fucks is because of this. Number one, it held the test of time. It literally is one of those films, no matter where it's at, I'll stop. Even with it being a slow burn, I'll stop and watch it. Number two, the things we've talked about today, the character development. They just didn't develop one character. They were developing, they were interdeveloping. If you don't know what that means, they didn't just separate and isolate, develop this character, not develop the character. They were developing as they went and playing off and playing off of each other as these things were happening. Like mm-hmm. again, you didn't have to ask yourself what happened to uh, Juanita's sister while Anthony was gone. She comes back, she kisses the motherfucker, like, God damn. Welcome home.
<laughs> like you, you see now she's into this, but she always was kind of that way, always alone, always had her eye. They are doing these things. And furthermore, the film takes advantage of all his resources. It doesn't you, it doesn't need all these explosions and gun battles and everything and car chasing. They saved all that. And really, when it comes to action, Lord, is it like fucking fifteen minutes of action in this two-hour film? Yeah. So it's and and based off the cover of the film, you think you're going to shoot them up, shoot them up, gang, or something. Mm -hmm. So for them to pull that off and to see these characters work together and again the tragedy is that chris tucker's career path could have been so different if this you know what i'm saying if it if it had been at a different time in an era so i think this is a film a lot of people should go back I, as i check we're going to challenge each other season to make me watch it i want you america i want the people that have never seen this film give this film a chance go out there and watch it and don't watch it from try to look at it from my perspective, just look at it from yours and you're gonna get, see a different movie than I am and that's what's beautiful about film. You saw it from your perspective based off your experiences in life and I saw it off of mine, but they did such a good job, they didn't lean to the left, right, up or down. There was no, it was a compass, which direction do you wanna go in? So mm -hmm. to me, this film is a five, even though it's some things we, we would have changed, but to me, it checks all the marks as a classic, stood the test of time and God damn it, man. It's just it's just one of those gems that I would always keep in my movie category and collection. Dead presidents. Five. For me, it would it would have been a five if not for the ending. That's mm -hmm. what prevented it from being a perfect film in my eyes. Mm -hmm. uh, I give it a four point five simply because I just I really Rush. wish they would have they would yeah taken their time with the ending a little bit more. Um, so yeah, a, a 4.5. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I'd mm -hmm. watch it again. I'd mm -hmm. recommend it. It's got everything that, that you, you laugh, you feel, That's, I think, you I think. Would, I would like to see you. I would like you to watch that with your dad and, and tell me what you, what he thought about it. Like if you and him sat down and watched it and then what, what do you think about it afterwards? Um, I don't have any family that have gone to war or anything. Oh. Uh, I mean, Angela's dad might be an inter might be an interesting take on it because he's seen the other side of combat. Or hell, but, maybe we should let Thomas watch it. Oh, I'm sure he. I'm sure he's got some some yeah. bad, some thoughts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. He's talking got thoughts you. about everything, <laughs> and they're never what you expect. So I have no fucking idea what old Seidel's yeah. in a. Yeah, man, but guys, <laughs> like that's what we together. Give it. That's a four point seven five. That's a solid. It's, 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 that's solid. more than solid. It's above average, guys. Yeah. So tell us what you thought about it. Please put your comments below. Hopefully, you've been talk talking in there, typing in the live chat. With that being said, let's get into common attractions. Money, 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 money. money. This is the. Uh, this is the most important coming attractions that ever. we've ever done. Ever. Um, there is a huge change on the horizon, and the change is coming for two reasons. Change uh, gone come, Sam Cook. The, the the main reason why is because there are so many films that we want to cover, and um, covering being able to cover one a month is just it's not going to allow us to get all the films out in our lifetime that that we'd want to cover. Mm -hmm. uh, so. We thought it would be better instead of instead of we're going to spend the same amount of time producing content, but instead of producing one full length episode every month, uh, we're going to break it up into bite sized pieces, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, 10 minutes. And we're going to be able to it's going to give us the ability to talk about more films, uh, more, more actors, more actresses, more subjects, more trending topics, more. I mean, hey, you know, yeah. So just to uh, give you guys an idea, a little a little preview of um, of what we have, like some of the segments that we're going to be doing. Uh, uh, Devil's Advocate, we're going to look at the lowest rated films on Rotten Tomatoes, the most controversial actors or canceled stars, and be a devil's advocate for these people and try to speak in defense of these people or projects and find some kind of redeemable factors. Uh, about Kevin Spacey, um, about uh, Plan Nine from Outer Space, about Will Smith. Uh, uh, um, me, you review. We're, we'll be reviewing the same film separately, chopping the reviews together, so you get the contrast of our thoughts. Uh, raw reviews. We'll be going to movies and just uh, filming our raw reaction directly after watching the movie and putting it up for you guys to enjoy, uncut, unfiltered. Um, that's the fucking trailer. We're, we're going to keep doing trailer reactions. Um, everything you need to know, we're going to keep that going uh, and, and drop uh, fact segments about different films. Uh, pop quiz hot shot. We'll, we'll be quizzing each other. With no, I think we're both yeah, taking we'll, the same movie quiz at the same time, trying to see who do, do the best. Yeah. And yeah. then uh, for all the Versus fans out there, we're going to be doing our own version of Versus called Cinema Versus, mm -hmm. where 
uh, he'll bring a movie to the table. I'll bring a movie to the table or an actor and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bring our best, uh, evidence for why our film or actor is better than the other one. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, he made me do it is one that I'm personally looking forward to where either he can assign a movie for me to review, or I can assign a movie for him to watch and review. There's a lot, as much movies as we have watched that are the same. I've seen a lot of films that he hasn't seen. He's seen a lot of films that I haven't seen. Good fellas. Dead precedents up until today. Yes. Uh, so the, it'll be a fun chance for uh, you to get like my, uh, my opinion on a film that I probably would have never seen if not for him and vice versa for him. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, and then, uh, for people that enjoy the uh, David Pressman interview, will be uh, pouring with Pressman. Yeah, but sim- he won't be dr- patron with Pressman. Yeah, something. I, I gotta <laughs> figure out my my concoction. That, but we'll be we'll be drinking some kind of alcoholic beverage with a friend of the show, David Pressman, and just talking the shit about movies. And another friend of the program, uh, David McGifford, the uh, a superstar assistant director who's worked on so many classics from Back to the Future to. Uh, Rain Man to Vanilla Sky. He has a he has a book that is currently in the process of being published that kind of details all of his um, different little micro moments within the productions that he's worked on. And we'll be uh, doing story time with David where we kind of go through those things. So th- that's just a handful of the segments to give you an idea of like, we're not dialing it back. We're just mm. switching things up. And the, and the other thing is that we've been doing this for three seasons now and we want to avoid like... This this format, it, it, we need to switch it up. So. Season basically season four is season hashtag attack the algorithm. That's what we'll be and, doing. And so we don't get complacent. Yeah, you know, very like, much so. Like we're we're taking ourselves out of the routine to to freshen things up and come back yeah. at this thing completely alive. We freshened up in a new studio, which you guys will be seeing is gonna look as okay. good, if not better. And like you said, to attack the algorithm because we've tried the long format. Mm-hmm. It's now we're going kind with short works, strokes. But yeah, we're gonna try this short and, thick. And, and we are holding ourselves hostage in season four K until we, we reach four K subscribers. There you go. That's uh Man, this is uh, bittersweet. This is, is, uh, bittersweet. This is the, final fucking, the final fucking goodbye. I feel well, it's like not a goodbye. It's, a, it's, it's not a goodbye, a, but it's a, it's a goodbye to this format. That, yeah, that but this format's been. cool, man. And, and here's the thing. You, you, you should have told them somewhat of the surprise. Every now and then when we deem so, we will do an old school format, a throwback. Oh, we'll yeah, do. yeah. And those episodes will be truly live. Uh, correct, like, yes. Yes. We'll produce them live. We'll drop. I think the one of the ones we'll live. be doing, we'll be doing Black Black Panther two live. Uh, yeah. A couple other things coming out live. And uh, so, guys, we'll be seeing you soon. You'll be seeing a lot more of us, and hopefully, we'll be seeing a lot more of you. Goodbye, 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 goodbye. Why don't you subscribe? It'll last longer.